Good morning. It's uh, 10 01 a.m., and I call this meeting to order. Will the secretary please take attendance of the oversight committee? Mr. Angelo? Mr. Guerin? Here. Mr. Holmes? Here. Mr. Margot? Here. Mr. Montgomery? Here. Dr. Rice? Here. Dr. Rosenfeld? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Members, the draft minutes from the February 15th and the April 7th. Oversight Committee meetings are available in your agenda packet behind tab one. Are there any corrections to the minutes as circulated? I have a correction. Dr. Mulrow was not in attendance. All right. Note that correction. Any other corrections? Good to have that lawyer's <laughs> eye. Yes. <laughs> the chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the to oversight committee meetings. So moved. As What'd you say? As amended. As amended. So moved. All right. All in favor, vote aye. Any opposed, the motion carries. As we remind ourselves every time we gather public comments, it's such an important part of our, our work. We, we work for the people of Texas and we appreciate when they take the time to come share their experiences with it and their in, insights. I understand that today we, do, we don't have anybody signed up for public comment, but I uh, look forward in the future to that robust participation by the, by the public. We've invited representatives from two secret grantees to provide presentations to the Oversight Committee. Dr. Dean Edwards from Baylor College of Medicine and Dr. Harpreet Singh from Emmatics Biotechnologies have joined us today. I'll ask Dr. Wilson to please come forward to introduce Dr. Edwards, and after Dr. Edwards' presentation, Mr. Lang will introduce Dr. Singh. Dr. Wilson, good morning. It is my uh, pleasure to welcome Dr. Dean Edwards, a Seifert grantee, uh, who is Professor of Cell and Molecular Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Edwards, studies the role of hormonal uh, control in the development and progression of breast cancer. And it is this research that uh, led him to a Seifert Individual Investigator uh, Award. In addition to his research programs, uh, Dr. Edwards is a leader of the uh, Dan Duncan NCI Designated Cancer Center at Baylor. He's responsible for the infrastructure and technology development, which is crucial for uh, the the cancer researchers at, at, at that institution. Um, and in that role, he leads a Seifert Core Facility Award. And we've asked uh, Dr. Edwards to come today to talk about the core facilities at Baylor, as well as the impact of the Seifert Awards uh, on those uh, programs and the, the research that they support. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you, Dean, and thank you for coming up from Houston this morning to be with us. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk today. You know, I, I was actually um, was hoping I could do this one day because I really wanted to show the kind of impact uh, the, the funding of these core facilities really has had on, on I can't speak for other institutions, but our institution, uh, I would be, um, I don't think it's an overstatement to say it, it, the impact has been huge. It's really transformed the way we do research it in, in this particular area that I'm going to talk about at Baylor College of Medicine. It's created opportunities that uh, um, we wouldn't have had otherwise. So, okay, here we go. So uh, this is the title. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself, why I'm even here today. <laughs> Uh, as uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned, I am a, a basic scientist. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, long-term interest in breast cancer, but in recent years, the last five or six years, uh, gotten very involved in, in, in uh, core facilities at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, overseeing all the, the core facilities for the uh, Duncan Cancer Center. I'm also executive director over all the, the uh, what we call advanced technology cores at Baylor College of Medicine. We have 26 of those now. We've, we've really expanded those 
over the last five or six years. And then um, I was fortunate enough to, to be the PI for uh, one of the early, I think one of the first funded secret core facility awards. Uh, and the title of that is Proteomic and Metabolomic Core, which uh, it was first funded in um, uh, December 2011. And um, I was really thrilled when there was a, uh, an RFA to actually have a chance to competitively renew those because we were really worried about this facility we'd built up that was so strong, not being able to sustain it for the long run, and we were uh, fortunate to get a competitive renewal uh, just six months ago. And so um, there's three other core facilities that have been funded now at Baylor College of Medicine. Two of them are, are brand new. Uh, one is a uh, uh, preclinical candidate drug discovery core by Marty Matzek, and the other is Michael Scherer, which is one of the first, I guess, uh, childhood cancer core facilities. And um, so I can't say too much about the impact of those. They've been in existence for about six months. I will mention the drug discovery one because it's highly integrated, it coordinated with our core. We're a discovery core, and we take discoveries to them to develop drugs. So this is. Also, I think, um, really powerful for us. And then the third one is the um, Texas Assistance Cancer Cell Therapy. This is actually uh, an extension of a GMP facility that manufactures therapeutic cells and, and viruses uh, for cancer patients. And this extends that capability across the state of Texas. And I won't talk about that uh, uh, today. So I thought maybe we should, for even scientists in the room or non-scientists, you know, what is a core facility? I thought maybe we should define that. And we talk about it in our, our place all the time because I don't like the word core much, and although you can keep it in your RFAs, it's fine. But I thought I should, dis because there, it, it's just not a great word. But anyway, it, it doesn't describe what we do. So I, I'll just mention this. So what is it? It's a centralized resource where you have very high-end, expensive instrumentation and technology platforms that are not feasible for any single cancer researcher to have in their own lab. Um, these core facilities have a dedicated scientific director who's really, and a research staff, and those people focus specifically on, on that technology and that, that specific area, and including managing huge data sets. Uh, the data analysis is a huge part of that. And so these resources then are, are made available to a really wide group of people on a collaborative project by project basis, a little bit more like the way physicists historically have done things with accelerators and so forth. Everybody can't have an accelerator to themselves. And so they come to us and, and we do project by project collaboration. So it really extends capabilities beyond you know, a single lab to many, many labs. And there's a lot of uh, sharing, cost sharing, as you'll see. This is very cost efficient. So those first four bullets tell you why it's efficient and wh why it makes sense and the practicality. But really, I think more important scientifically is this last bullet is it creates multidisciplinary team science, which is really required for modern biomedical science. We, we no longer do our, we no longer sit in our own corner and do our own thing. It has to be multidisciplinary, and it's so complex, you really have to have team science. And this core grant mechanism is really brilliant because it really creates a, a platform to bring these uh, team scientists together. So my preferred title for core is really uh, Advanced Technology Shared Resource Facilities uh, for Biomedical Research, and maybe is a better definition than core. And so what our core about is, I, I gave you the name of our, the title of our core, and it's proteomics, cancer proteomics, and metabolomics. Again, for maybe non-scientists, omics really means global. And really what this means is the si simultaneous analysis of all the genes in a cell or organism, all the proteins, and all the metabolites. That you measure these all at the same time. So genomics is just an analysis of all the DNA that make up our genes, and we want to identify what are the mutations or damage associated with cancer. Proteomics is the analysis of all the proteins encoded by the genes, and these proteins, of course, are important. Uh, they carry out the function and they create the structure for tissues and cells, and metabolomics are just analyzing all the metabolites, amino acids, carbohydrates, lipids, fatty acids. Uh, the the, the mo small molecules that carry out the work are the energy of the, of the system. So this is what omics science, you hear genomics, proteomics, metabolomics all the time. So this sort of depicts um, 
the rationale for why we're interested, why is it important to study all the proteins and all the metabolites in the cell. I think everybody here is familiar, whether you're a scientist or not, in the Human Genome Project, that uh, the human genome has been sequenced for some time now, and we identified all the genes, we know the sequence, what all the genes are. And there's also a program that's finished now, too, which is the, the TCGA, the Human uh, Cancer Genome Atlas Project, where all the major uh, tumors in, in humans were sequenced to find where are the mutations and things that might uh, be causative of cancer. But the DNA in the genome is not sufficient. We, we need to go on to, to look at the proteome and the metabolome. So this is the rationale for our core facility and, and what we're trying to do. And this, this slide, I can't point to it, <laughs> actually depicts some of that. And the reason DNA is not sufficient, it, the DNA just merely provides, it, it codes for making the other molecules in the cell and tissues uh, that carry out function. And those other molecules is DNA uh, synthesizes RNA, RNA synthesizes protein, and the proteins synthesize the small molecule metabolites. And it's really the protein and metabolites that carry out the function. Th these are the things that we really need to know about in cancer biology. So this is a big challenge. Um, so um, we need to know that the aberrations in the proteins and the metabolites will contribute to uh, cancer progression. And so our interest is to find what these are as potential uh, therapeutic targets that we don't know about from sequencing the genes. And so that's our ultimate goal. But to show you this and why we have this core facility and why it's so fun, important, I think, to, to fund it and keep it going, is the technology for doing the proteome and metabolome is really challenging, uh, more challenging if, than, than the genome or DNA. Uh, the tech, and part of the reason, if you can see from this slide, is there's only 25,000 genes, and we know how to measure all those now. Uh, proteome and metabolome is a less mature science, and it's more challenging. There's 100,000 RNA molecules. Um, there's a million proteins in the cell, not 25,000 genes. I can't go into the reason for that. And metabolites, there's about 3,000. Um, there's no single technology now to measure all these proteins and these metabolites, so that's our challenge. Uh, we can measure classes of these proteins, classes of metabolites, but we can't do them all. Our eventual goal is to do them all, but we can begin to piece together the, the entire proteome, looking at all the proteins and all the metabolites, but uh, it's challenging. And um, the um, so, uh, so that's the challenge here, and, and, and we ultimately want to get to that, uh, and we're moving in that direction. So the, the goal of our core, I think anybody doing proteomes, metabolomes, is to identify new protein markers, new metabolite markers that can be used for diagnostics or, or therapeutic targets for precision cancer medicine that we don't know from just doing looking at the genes. And so that's the challenge of our course. So this is sort of the mission and goals of our core facility. Uh, we have to develop cutting edge technologies and platforms and data analysis tools to look at the cancer proteome, metabolome. Uh, we're making great strides, we got a ways to go. Uh, we wanna make these technologies available to individual cancer researchers, which we're doing. Our, again, our goal is basic science discoveries at this point uh, of our core facility. And I'll, I'll mention more about the long term. Uh, clinical goals, um, and we provide high-end specialized instrument instrumentation for this, and this is primarily mass spectrometry. This is the main instrumentation and technology that we use for both the metabolome and proteome. And again, our long-term goal for cancer, precision cancer medicine is to identify new protein markers, metabolite, therapeutic, biomarkers um, for cancer that we don't know about now. And so what does our core facility look like? I don't know if you can see this so well. It's not the greatest. Um, as I mentioned, mass spectrometry is the major technology. We have 11 of those in our core facility now. These are really expensive propositions. And why do we have so many? As I mentioned earlier, for the proteome metabolome, there's no single technology to get everything. We have to have different instruments, different platforms to do classes of these molecules and piece things together. Uh, these instruments cost anywhere from a half a million to over a million. We have six for metabolomics, five for the proteomics now. Uh, some of these were purchased on the first secret core grant we got. Um, others from the institution, we've gone to some foundation grants also. So we've pieced this together, but a big part of this was secret funding. 
But even once we have these instruments, they're really expensive to maintain. It's almost a half a million dollars just to maintain these, to, to keep updating them, keep, keep them uh, preventative maintenance, the things we have to do. And, and about two years into our core facility, um, uh, I convinced our college that we need a really new laboratory. We need a properly designed lab to put all these instruments and really create a first-rate state-of-the-art facility, and, and the college immediately did that. They, they created a new 5,000 square foot space for us that is designed specifically for mass spec. It's a little bit like in the old days having the supercomputers. You have to have special air handling, temperature control, a lot of things you have to have gases that are imported there. So we really had to create a, a lab for these uh, instruments as well. Uh, so what does our team look like? As I mentioned earlier, what's really important about, I think, this grant mechanism is it helps you put together a multidisciplinary team. Um, that, that we couldn't have done, uh, uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. That's like the wrong word there. Anyway, this is what our team looks like. So I'm the person who coordinates all of this uh, of the team. So we have a proteomics group. We have a leader who's one of the world's leaders in, in mass spec proteomics, Anna Melavanya. Um, she has a staff of eight mass spectrometrists that are really specialized in this area. Most of them have PhDs, some masters. That, that's the, sort of the lowest level we have. Um, we have a metabolomics group, uh, Rin Shrikumar heads that. There's six mass spectrometers. But really importantly, when we renewed our grant, uh, what, what was clear to us after we had five years of building this and generating a lot of data, we needed a whole computational data analysis group. So we, Christian Kortha heads that now in our renewal grant. So we have a, a, a staff of bioinformaticists that, that know how to handle all the massive data coming out. And then we integrate all these uh, com components and we collaborate on a investigator, investigator, project by project basis when the investigators come to us. And those investigators have their own grants to, to do some of their own studies, but they come to us uh, to do the proteome and the metabolome parts of this. So what is, how does the core facility operate? It's kind of the workflow. Uh, again, we're, we're collaborative with individuals that walk in the door. Um, so the first thing we do, we consult and we do select the projects. We don't take any project. We want to make sure it it's, has merit and it's cancer relevant, good use of secret resources and other resources. Uh, once we, in most of the cases, we accept projects, not all. Uh, then we assist up front with the experimental design. Uh, usually investigators prepare samples and bring them to us and we, we do the, the mass spec runs and, and then at the end, we have our computational guys that manage that data and help them interpret what does this data mean in terms of biology or potential clinical results. So what do we spend the secret monies on? Well, these monies are spent uh, for the, all, you saw this massive number of staff that we have, the equipment maintenance, supplies, and really important, I'll mention in a minute, is we're continuing, we continue all the time to develop new technologies because, like I said, this is a rapidly emerging field. Technologies are not quite there yet, and we, we, we need to be at the forefront. So we, we spend some of the secret funds to continually do new technology development. This is what our budget looks like. Um, there's a lot of sharing now of this facility in terms of funding it. Uh, CPRIT right now is funding 950000 a year. Our total, our total cost, as you might imagine from the team I put together, I showed you, is about $2.8 million a year to fund this facility. And so about 34% of that comes from the CPRIT core grant. Our institution is matching that at, at a pretty high level. We're also um, funded by Ken Osborne's NCI P30 uh, Cancer Center grant, and so that contributes. And then the users, the users ha have their own grants, they have to share in some of this cost. So user grants, they, they pay for part of it. Now this is really an, really an important number. The users, um, yeah, they always complain to us it costs too much money, but, but they're only paying 26 cents on a dollar, right? And so this really enables, there are a few investigators that are maybe lots and lots of grant money could afford to do this without subsidies, but this really makes uh, even smaller labs have an ability to use this core, uh, but they have to share in some of it as well. So this makes it really cost effective and, and really expands the ability to, to work with a lot of investigators. So what I was mainly coming here, so I want to give you background on the science and what we do, and I want to show you the impact of, of what this has, at least 
all the data I can put together. So th it has built infrastructure and capabilities. Again, we, we started the funding in 2012. We have, in 2012, we had no metabolomic capability at all at our institution. In a very short time, we've become sort of national leaders in this area in terms of building technologies. And also proteomics, we had a very small group. And so both of those groups have built leading edge in, in really five, six years to become national leaders in this area. Um, two very important things. I was able to leverage the institution within about the first year after we had the secret funding. We realized even though it was, it was generous funding, we, it wasn't sufficient to do everything we wanted to do. The institution quickly, uh, I, it was easy to leverage them. They, they, they built the space out, they bought some more mass specs, it wasn't enough, and they, they decided to subsidize in our operation, so it really was good. And the other thing I have to say, this, CS, uh, this CFSA award, <laughs> maybe you're more familiar with that mechanism, acronym than I am, this is really a brilliant thing that the CPRIT, I think, did. Uh, because this is a unique grant mechanism that doesn't exist anywhere. It's not offered by any agencies, NIH. Nobody else offers it. And what I mean by this is this is really comprehensive funding for this kind of team science. And this is why we have to do science in the future. And so what I mean by that is this CPRIT award actually helps to fund equipment, expensive equipment, uh, the ongoing operations, which you saw, and also what's really brilliant is it sets aside some money we can continually do uh, development of new technologies. And it's not just the, the hardware, the, the mass spec and the lab stuff, but also creating new data analysis tools that are not out there. They're not available commercially. And this is brilliant. There's no, there, there are grant mechanisms where you can buy an equipment only and then you're on your own. There are things you can do research, okay, but actually getting research for technology development is tough. There's almost no mechanisms for operations in a course. So this is really, I think, a, a unique, powerful mechanism. And like I said, it enables us to do things uh, with a very large group of, of investigators. So I'll show you some of our accomplishments in the first five years. And I'm not making up these numbers. Every time I see it, I scratch my head. And I, I go back to our individual quarter. Are you sure about these numbers? <laughs> these so we did, uh, in the first five years, we did projects for 256 investigators. 90% are Baylor. Baylor is very heavy in this area now. And we, we do extend to some other TMC institutions. That resulted in 76 publications from these groups on metabolomics, proteomics may not mean m m something to everybody, and this is not every paper is in science, no, nature cell and cancer cell, uh, et cetera, but a lot of papers in very high impact uh, journals, high profile publications. Economic impact, there's a lot of, um, uh, I guess, bang for the dollar for every investment uh, that CEPR is putting into this core facility, getting much, much more back in terms of new grants. So. Over the first five years, there were 45 new grants acquired by our core users to do proteomics and metabolomics. Uh, that's 14, those grants total up to $14 million in direct costs and $49 million total over the four or five years of the grant. So the, so the uh, $1 million a year that goes into CEPRIT core is really generating $14 million a year in new grants. And th these grants, uh, like I said, we've either put in, the core has provided the data that goes into these grant applications or, and or those grants really require this, going forward, this core facility to, to carry out that grant. So these grants are actually dependent on our core facility being there for the, for the long term. Uh, we kind of created a monster here. Uh, anyway, so uh, this probably won't mean a lot of people, we can skip over this slide, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, technology development's a big part of this, and, and we have become sort of national leaders in this area over the last five years. Uh, and so our mass spectrometry proteomic group have done a lot uh, to, to develop uh, new technology platforms. As I mentioned, you have to have a different platform for different classes of proteins. They've done that. We even have some other antibody-based, non-mass spec-based platforms we've developed. And our metabolomics group, uh, again, different classes of, of uh, uh, metabolites. And really, more importantly, when we had our renewal grant, we realized we needed to build our computational guys, and they've built up some uh, data analysis tools. Um, so what about scientific discoveries? As I mentioned, our, our goal is new biomarkers, new, new targets for therapy. 
and I've just sort of listed some of the things without being too specific that have come out of our users of this core. Uh, they've identified many m metabolic and protein pathways that, that appear to be drivers of initiation and progression of cancer subtypes that we didn't know about before. So these are potential um, therapeutic targets. Uh, very importantly, a lot of our group is looking at what's responsible for resistance to certain therapies, chemo and endocrine therapies, and they've developed, again, metabolic pathways or protein pathways that we didn't know about that could be involved. Uh, that could lead to new therapeutic uh, opportunities, diagnostic markers, biomarkers, uh, um, and as I mentioned, therapeutic targets. So some of the things that the targets are reprogrammed metabolic and energy pathways we didn't know about. Cancer cells can, can do that. Um, splicing factors, protein signaling pathways, and hormone resistant breast and prostate cancer. These, these are areas of focus of our group that these new potential therapeutic targets are coming out. And I, I will mention, um, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule in terms of where we see, I'll, I'll give you a timeline of our core, where, where we're looking at the future and where we are now, is some of our, our discoveries have already gone on to drug development projects with our recently funded drug discovery uh, core facility. And I just listed some of these targets here um, uh, that actually came out of uh, dis our discovery phase of our core facility. And so the other thing uh, that our core facility, I think the impact of that is, is faculty recruitments and national recognition, as I mentioned. We've really become uh, known for being uh, leaders in technology development. And two prominent scientists in cancer genomics and proteomics were recruited to Baylor College of Medicine fairly recently, Matthew Ellis from WashU and Bing Zhang from Vanderbilt. They both received secret uh, recruitment awards. And they were instrumental in bringing uh, the National Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, which is CPTAC. So this is equivalent to the Cancer Genome Atlas that, that sequenced tumors for, for mutations in genes. Now they want to look at proteins in tumors and what kind of, do, do those mutations in genes translate into changes in proteins in, in, in different tumors? So that created, uh, that brought that grant to Baylor and we're part of this big consortium now with with Harvard, MIT, Hopkins, uh, Mount Sinai, NYU, and Michigan. Uh, this is part of this national consortium from the NCI now to do this tumor proteomic, which we're calling a proteogenomic study, um, which is being led by this group at Baylor College of Medicine. And, and they would not have come to Baylor if we didn't, we hadn't built up our proteomic metabolomic um, core capability. So I uh, mentioned- Peter, Could I interrupt you just one yes, moment? Yes, of course. Uh, could I ask you to, to wrap up your presentation by 10.30 uh, so the that's it. panel has an opportunity I'm to sorry, ask some I questions? I'm sorry, I went too far. Uh, I'm sorry. So this is the timeline we're looking uh, at. This is the wrap up. Um, we're into our second five years of this secret core facility. We're, we've gone from basic discoveries now more into uh, validating biomarkers, looking at clinical translation. As I mentioned, we're beginning to interact with the, uh, the other drug discovery uh, core that's been just funded. And our long-term goal is uh, we want these uh, biomarker discoveries to go into clinical studies and eventually commercialization, which I just have this timeline thing to show you realistically the, the time frame it takes to do this. And uh, I'll stop there. All right, thank sorry, you very sorry much. Sorry for going over. No, yeah. very interesting, we appreciate it very much. You're sharing your time with us and the great work you do. Any questions? Uh, I would I'd be like glad to answer. Opportunity course, for members yeah. of the Oversight Committee to ask questions. Dr. Roosevelt. Thank you. Very impressive presentation. Um, could, could you could you pull your microphone around and? How about this? It's better. Thanks. Um, could you uh, just briefly describe what facilities are available in the preclinical core? Yeah, they, they have some uh, uh, very sophisticated chemical, small molecule chemical libraries, and one of them is actually these DNA encoded libraries, which are the sort of newest technology. So they have a lot of libraries and they have high throughput screening capability, uh, so they can actually screen through these. These libraries in some cases have billions of, of different compounds and screen through those. And then they have some preclinical uh, models uh, where you can test and, and and sort of isolate and identify lead compounds that you would eventually go into clinical studies. So they have, they have a lot of medicinal chemists, 
a, a lot of high throughput screening and, um, and pharmacologists that look at the, the pharmacology of some of these drugs and, and, and animal. This is all preclinical animal models with the idea of developing a, a lead compound. And again, a lot of what our role is we, we feed them the new targets to, to go after, so the new targets to develop drugs against. Mm -hmm. Can, uh, let me ask you about funding. Um, CPRIT will ev eventually sundown. Yeah. Uh, have you made provisions for how your laboratory is going to continue after CPRIT funding goes away? Yeah, I think w we were already thinking about that. I mean, we have built up this b big infrastructure. We do need to maintain it, but I think um, we're always seeking other grant mechanisms. I think as our investigators get more and more grants funded in this area, they can share. We're going to start asking them to share a little bit more. If you saw that slide, they, they only pay 27 percent. We're going to start. So I think we, we have some plans for sustaining this long term. If secret went away, it would hurt us. Sure. But I think we have over 10 years, I think we will have built this to the point where we, we can find ways to sustain it. Um, but I'm hoping secret will continue. Uh, with this, and this one funding because it's the technology. We, we never know where the technology is going to go. As, as new things arise, there's obviously going to be new needs down, down the road. But. And one last quick question. Um, you, I guess you said this first CEPRA grant was five years ago? Yeah, it was five. We just started our second five years. And yeah. I was wondering, since then, have uh, you licensed any new inventions from your uh, from uh, from your work over the past five years, or have you created or spun out any new companies? No, based no, on we're, the technology? that's why I wanted to put this timeline. I think the commercialization, as you can see, is probably going to go beyond, you know, just the time it takes to do that. Some of these new uh, potential therapeutic targets that have come out of us, those investigators have filed invention disclosures. I don't know. I don't know where we are in that process, but I think I think our eventual goal is to do that as we get more and more of these novel targets and they go to our drug discovery core. They're, they're definitely, I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. I gave you an example of three that are starting to go forward through this pipeline, but I think as we get, as we're getting through our next five years, I anticipate there's going to be a lot more of that. But the commercialization has to go through clinical studies and that, that takes some time. But Thank you very much. So, thank you. Dr. Rice. Dr. Edwards, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, really interesting and good for, I think, the board here to have a little deeper understanding of, of the whole um, core facility um, well, thank you. You know, mechanism, and that's uh, very enlightening. So thank you for that. Um, I guess I had a number of questions, but I'll just have, I'll, I'll, I'll do one, I'll give you one question and maybe follow up um, through other channels. Aside, well, we have choppies of the slides. I'd love to copy of a PDF of the slides, something like that, so just to look okay. through. You know, the 90-10 split is of interest. I just wanted to sort of explore with you. Do you think that, you know, other Texas institutions, I, I don't know who may have a similar kind of construct, and, and maybe, you know, major institutions need it, but I just wondered, you know, is it a marketing challenge, or is it possible that a 50-50 a split or 60-40, 60 Baylor, 40 other institutions What's an ideal balance of that, and how might we get there, if you have an opinion on that? Yeah, um, I think, you know, our, our institution is pretty large. I think it's just, for us right now, we could do more for people, but I th we're sort of, e even as great as our funding is, we've sort of reached, we're 100% we're capacity. We've sort of reached our limit, and we could certainly do more, um, but, you know, and that, that's just how the numbers work out. There's so many people at Baylor College of Medicine that, that need to do that, and that's our first goal, I guess. I mean, that's, um, there are some, uh, there is a metabolomics core facility, MD Anderson. I think they're, they're, they're lagging behind us a little bit. I mean, they got funded later, so I think we're a little ahead of them. I guess thinking forward, um, maybe the state of Texas and Seabrook doesn't want to fund multiple metabolomic, proteomic facilities. Maybe you fund one for the entire state. I, I don't know. Um, but we're also a little bit um, looking at the needs of our own basic scientists and our, and our own clinical translational scientists. So I think it might not be reasonable to say, well, let's have one for the entire state because th there's certain scientific 
needs and, and, and preferences. So we, we customize this a bit for Baylor College of Medicine scientific needs. There's a lot of back and forth, and particularly bringing Matt Ellis and Bing Zhang here with the CP tag. So it may not make sense to have one size fits all. Maybe it makes sense for uh, different major institutions to have their own uh, core facilities like this. Thank you. And I would just maybe just take that and wonder out loud with Dr. Wilson, maybe this is maybe sort of a, a, a interesting future conversation to wonder, you know, how much, um, I mean, to your point, I guess maybe 9010 is exactly what it's going to always be because you've got so much demand that you wouldn't think that other institutions, you don't have room unless you had a bigger grant. Yeah, and, right. and, and maybe there's some locality that is the right thing. And that, that that's, having that's what just is practicality for us. But one thing we do do, and there's a lot, like you see, there's the interaction between these two cores at Baylor, but we interact with the MD Anderson core and other cores, and we're sharing a lot of our, they're coming over to us, because we were funded before they were, so they're, they're gathering some of the technology for us. I and mean, there's a lot of sharing here, which extends, you know, super funding. We should do that. I mean, they shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel, what we've already done. Uh, so there can be a lot of sharing of technology and, and information between different cores funded by the by CPRIT, and there, there should be, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Do you find that BCM turns down requests to use the core facility, or uh, does that 10 percent represent your accommodation of every outsider who seeks to use the Oh, oh do we turn down outsiders? Um, I couldn't give you the exact number, but I'm sure we do. Uh, we do, that's just what we can accommodate when we can. We actually turned down some internal people, as I mentioned on one of my slides. So we have a, a filtering process. If we don't think the project has great scientific merit or if it doesn't have cancer, obvious relevance, well, we don't do the project because yep. uh, either. So. Maybe to but that's ask rare. the question a little that's differently, uh, do you turn down some requests that have great scientific merit because of, from outsiders because of capacity? Well, I, I, should, I should qualify. We never turn anybody down, but what ends up happening is we say, we'd love to do this, we'll do it when, when we can, it becomes a time frame. So we put them on kind of a, a queue, a wait list. If it's a great project, we never turn them down. We should never do that. But they get on a queue list, and, and you know scientific investigators, everything has to be done tomorrow, right? Nobody wants to wait. So they'll just find other avenues frequently. They, they might go to a commercial outfit or maybe they go to another a facility in another state or somewhere else. But, then, you know, scientists will, <laughs> path of least resistance, they'll, they'll find another way to, to get it done eventually. Um, uh, but so, I, I, no, we never, in that sense, turn people away, but the wait list is, uh, a deterrent to um, other outside investigators. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Just, I just wondered if we could go back over the part where Dr. Edwards said the, the oversight committee was brilliant, because he said it like two or three times. <laughs> well, whoever's responsible for this grant mechanism, I, I think it was a brilliant mechanism. And I didn't appreciate it until we got into it and started doing this. And, and it got me very excited and continued. And the renewal, even the renewal, we were very worried about that. That the, when the renewal opportunity came out, was created great excitement, and, and uh, we're, we're so happy to, to have that. Uh, it really is going to sustain our, our longer-term goals. Can I just make the comment, Will, that it is unlikely anybody on the oversight committee had anything to do with the idea, <laughs> and that it, we, it's devoted. No, I'm to not sure I said oversight committee was. No, no, exactly, oh. exactly. So <laughs> certainly, it's the science officers. Who's working it? Uh, um, I'm, I'm curious. Strike what. Dr. Rice said from the record, and we'll leave, <laughs> we'll leave uh, Mr. Montgomery, the, the lawyer, the, the trial lawyer's interpretation of what you said. Oh, that was their interpretation. Okay. I don't think I said oversight. <laughs> <laughs> thank, but, you but if you, if thank you very much. Whoever Dr. wants to take credit for that, I'm fine with it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for your remarks. Thank, thank you for your appreciate great work. Being I appreciate here it. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lang, will you please come forward and introduce Dr. Singh? Thank you. You know, it said uh, success has a thousand fathers and failures and orphans. So mm -hmm. This is an example of that. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Harpreet Singh. Uh, Dr. Singh's the uh, founder and CEO of Imatix uh, Biotechnology. He actually founded the company uh, while he was a graduate student in Germany. And uh, so he's, he was the, um, the chief scientific officer of the company for 15 years, during which time they raised uh, $64 million in investment funds. Uh, in 2015, he came to the United 
States, initiated a collaboration with MD Anderson, uh, which is Imatix uh, US, and uh, they've raised uh, uh, a CPRID grant as well as additional funding. Uh, Dr. Singh has uh, his background is in chemistry and immuno, uh, immunotechnology, uh, biochemistry. Specifically, when he was in, in his PhD program, he was one of the pioneers in immunotherapies, T cell immunotherapies for the uh, for, uh, for treatment of cancer. Um, so anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome him. He'll be giving a presentation on the uh, company Imatix and the work that they're doing in cancer immunotherapy. Thank you very much, Mr. Lang. Dr. Singh, thank you for being here today and thank you for your extraordinary work. Appreciate your making the time to share with us. Well, thank you, Michael, for the very kind introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me thank you for the opportunity to present here on our progress. Uh, we're dedicated to cancer immunotherapy, and we've made progress in the last two years. It <coughs> is um, very important, and that's thanks to the CPRID product development grant, a very generous grant that we got from the state of Texas, for which we're very grateful to. So as I said, we're dedicated to cancer immunotherapy and I've been working in cancer immunotherapy for 20 years, but now, now is really the right time. Um, this, this new modality, immunotherapy, has truly entered a new era. And the game changers, really, that we've seen in the past few years are two. One, checkpoint inhibitors that virtually release the breaks from immune cells that are already pre-existing in the tumors. And secondly, so-called adoptive cell therapy, where you utilize the soldiers of the immune system called T cells, and you make them iron and dangerous and, and let them go and search and destroy cancer. And both these mechanisms actually have achieved enormous progress. And now cancer immunotherapy really is a new true utility to fight cancer. Um, to illustrate two examples here from two uh, world-renowned investigators, Patrick Yu at Emily Anderson Cancer Center and Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania, who've utilized these cells called T cells and showed how powerful they are. Um, you can see here on these pictures, patients treated with those type of T cells, different types of, of armory of these T cells, um, that those patients, some of those with uncurable diseases, observed actually spectacular complete responses. So tumors virtually melting away. Uh, this is fantastic progress. This is truly game changing. But there is a problem. Right now, this success is really limited to few cancers and subpopulations. The checkpoint inhibitors, which have shown spectacular success, they are limited to cancers that have high mutational load. So they show a high rate of mutations. And not all cancers, like glioblastoma or ovarian cancer, have that type of high mutational load. Um, CAR T cell therapy, which has been very successfully applied now in the past few years, and we will see the first CD19 CAR T cells actually entering the market possibly this year, um, they have been very successful in treating liquid cancers. But there is much more than liquid cancers. There are a lot of solid cancers, non-small cell lung cancer, squamous cell type, ovarian cancer, head and neck cancer, that are currently not treated well and where, there are, where there's little, um, actually, utility um, of current um, clinical options. There's a high medical need. So what we really need is to expand that utility of immune therapy. And the solution is targets. We need to really make these T cells recognize targets that are specifically found on solid tumor tissues, those tissues that are currently solid cancers that are not really treatable with the current options, and, and, and work on more targets. The missing targets, that is really the solution. And, and I was pleased to hear actually uh, very eloquently um, also about those targets and those peptides. That's not only a view that we have. You see here those leaders in the field of cancer immune therapy actually that have been very successful in this first wave of immune therapy, clearly stating we need more targets, really expand beyond liquid cancers uh, and to move into other solid cancers. So those leaders have delivered that success. They confirmed the need. Um, they have really made T cells into very powerful missiles. But what we now need to do is turn these T cells into guided missiles. This is where we come in. Uh, we are leaders, and we've been working on this for more than 15 years, in the discovery of targets. And what we really do is providing a navigation system, a GPS for T cells. And that's what we do, and that's what we are dedicated to, and we're passionate about, and we've brought this to Texas. So how does this work? Um, this is now a little sort of basic immunology. I'll walk you through that. But we had the pleasure actually already understanding uh, before about DNA and RNA and proteins. And now those proteins actually in every living cell 
they further degrade it to shorter protein fragments called peptides. And those peptides are then shuttled on the surface by so-called HA receptors. And that provides a wonderful mechanism by the immune system for T cells to dock on the top of these cells and recognize these peptides, these short protein fragments, and understand really, is the cell healthy or is it unhealthy? And if the cell is unhealthy, it will present, for instance, if it's a cancer cell, it will present cancer-specific targets. And then T cells are capable of recognizing these cancer-specific targets on the surface and destroy these tumor cells. Um, what we do, what we've done for the last 15 years, is systematically deciphering these peptides. We heard about omics and ohms, so there's the genome, there's the proteome. What we look at, what's recognized by T cells, is called the immunopeptidome. And we are truly, and I know this sounds a little bold, but we're truly world leaders in cancer immunopeptidomics. This is what we've done for 15 years, long actually before people could spell immuno-oncology. So it's wonderful to be now in this space and, and apply this with all these missiles that these wonderful people here have developed. So what we've done over the last 10 years very systematically is what we call our internal human immunopeptidome program. This has been done in Germany, and the company founded in Germany. We've systematically looked at 20 different cancer tissue types. We've systematically looked at 40 different normal tissue types. It's very important to understand the difference between healthy and unhealthy tissue. And we've discovered millions of peptide sequences using high-throughput mass spectrometry. You heard that before, so that's also the technology that we use, but we apply it to use immunopeptidomics. Now, from these millions of peptides, in the last two years, we filed 20 patent applications uh, that are total um, sort of constituting more than 4,000 tumor-associated targets. And of those 4,000 tumor-associated targets, we have now prioritized 70 that actually show high selectivity in certain types of tumors. Some are present on ovarian cancer, some are present on lung cancer, some are broadly presented on various cancers, and all of them are now used and evaluated to be moved forward, to translate it into clinical science and clinical development into products. And Imatix US has received an exclusive perpetual license to all of the peptides that are discovered by Imatix that have been discovered in the last 10 years and that will be discovered in the future. And that's exclusively for adoptive cell therapy. So we can utilize all the know-how that we've built over a decade in Germany. We've brought that to Texas. And now, together with MD Anderson Cancer Center, we're taking that to cancer patients. So this is how we built Imatix US. Um, really, the starting point was fantastic investigators, renowned people at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Scientific co-founders of Imatix US are Patrick Hughes, the head of cancer medicine um, at, at MD Anderson, and Cassian Yee, um, who is actually a CPRID established investigator award recipient um, and who moved from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle to Houston, Texas to establish his science. Both of them are closely working together with us. Uh, what we are delivering into this, so Imatix Germany, is targets, so-called T cell receptors, so those are the structures that can bind these targets, um, management and funding. Um, and what MD Anderson is bringing in is all their know-how expertise um, GMP manufacturing, so how to produce these cells so that they can be to transfer it and reinfuse to patients. And as you know, what MD Anderson is, is best of is, is a clinical infrastructure that is really um, very impressive. Um, together, we have co launched Emadix US Inc. with the wonderful support of CPRIT. Um, this has been done in 2015, and we now have hired 41 people, full time employees, since the start actually of the CPRIT grant, which is even a few people above the plan that we actually had in our initial CPRID application. We've set up a state-of-the-art research and development and a GMP manufacturing facility with the help of Texas Medical Center and the University of Health, um, and are now moving forward into clinical trials. Let me show you what we do, actually, um, in these clinical trials. There are three different modalities, development tracks that we are developing, um, called ACTLOC, ACT Engine, and ACT ELO. And I'll just focus on ACTLOC and ACT Engine today because those are the, those mechanisms that are funded by the CPRID grant. So ACTLOC uses the body's own immune cells, the T cells, selects those T cells that can specifically recognize the Imatix targets and then actually activates these T cells. These T cells are dormant and they're very few in numbers. So we activate them, we make them armed and dangerous and we expand them to billions of these T cells. 
So imagine now billions of these armed and dangerous soldiers now reinfuse into the patient, very specifically recognizing targets that we over years have described to be specifically found in cancer. The second modality is ECT engine, where we are using gene therapy. Those are established, this is an established weaponry now. Um, we are using gene therapy, but what's novel now are our targets and our T cell receptors that we're introducing um, into um, these T cells. We're reprogramming those T cells, literally, so that they can recognize cancer cells. And then, again, billions of these T cells, billions of these Navy SEAL soldiers actually being reinfused um, into uh, these patients. Um, the ACTLOG work was pioneered by Cassian Yee, as I t said, a secret established recipient, uh, awards recipient. Uh, Cassian Yee has been very successful um, at Fred Hutchins and now also at M. Anderson to show that his methodology, ACTLOG, actually really works. And works doesn't mean that you have great papers, which is obviously important to publish your science. Work means that actually works in patients. And so he has shown over the past 10 years uh, in multiple trials that applying these T cells can lead to complete responses. So you see here computer tomography scans on the left, two different patients on the top and the bottom, and the left the patient before treatment, large bulky metastases that completely disappeared after T cell treatment. This is very impressive. He's done that in melanoma. Now we want to actually take this beyond melanoma into other uh, tumor entities. And what we're now doing is applying not just one target, what he did, because nobody had a knowledge about other targets, what we're now doing is applying eight different targets to these patients. And those patients are receiving up to four different T-cell products directed against four different T-cell targets. And those are applied in a highly personalized fashion. So a patient comes in and we only give a T-cell product to a target that is actually expressed in that particular patient. And that is truly personalized cancer immunotherapy. And this is what we can, this is what we do, and we can do it because we have so many of these targets that we can pick from. So we've made enormous progress preclinically. We've qualified our GMP T cell manufacturing lab. Um, we've successfully discussed the ACTLOG concept, which is novel because no one has applied so many targets at the same time to cancer patients and cell therapy before. We've successfully discussed that with the FDA. Um, we have designed the clinical trial. The initial trial will be uh, in squamous lung cancer, head and neck cancer, ovarian cancer, and esophagus cancer, and the clinical study has been internally approved at MD Anderson. We're waiting FDA approval any day, and then we can start the trial actually mid of this year. We are expecting to see first data already by end of 2018, uh, safety data showing that the therapy is applicable in a safe way, that's very important in a phase one study, but we actually hope to see that tumors will shrink. This is what we sort of started this for. ACT engine, um, gene therapy, as I explained. So we're reprogramming T cells to recognize specifically our aromatics targets. Um, this is a concept that has been very successfully developed over the past uh, years by a number of institutions, including MD Anderson. And here we are now introducing in our very first trial a completely novel target and a proprietary T cell receptor to that novel target and introducing that now into these cancer patients. This will be most likely in lung cancer, ovarian cancer, other cancers. Um, and here we have now also complete successfully GMP manufacturing setup. So that is very important. You have to make your cells in a very standardized and robust way and also develop the gene therapy vector, um, so-called retrovirus vector. Um, and this now really yields very, very good and results preclinically. So we're now translating that into the patients. We're going to start the trial mid of this year, so we're on an ambitious time plan, and again, by end of 2018, we're hoping to see, besides very good safety results, also to see that, that this could actually work therapeutically. Um, we are not stopping at this one target. We're now creating further T cell receptors against further novel um, cancer targets that we've discovered, and those will actually move into additional ACT engine clinical programs. All of them is done together with MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, an institution that is equipped extremely well of handling these cell therapies. Let me summarize on the final two slides our progress that we've made since mid-2015, since we started operations also co-founded by CPRIT. As I told you, we've successfully completed preclinic development of ACT programs on time. Um, we have successfully discussed all these preclinical data with FDA, and for Actolog, we got green light to proceed also for ACT Engine to proceed principally into those trials um, and now awaiting FDA approval to start those trials. 
um, and we filed the IND, that's the clinical trial application for Actolog, um, actually recently with FDA and are about to file the second IND actually within the next days, literally. On the business side, we've made progress, obviously we're very, very grateful for the 19.7 million CPRID grant that we were awarded by the state of Texas. Um, such a grant comes with an obligation on our side to deliver what we've promised. Um, it also comes with the matching from our investors, um, and they've matched the 20 million CPRID uh, grant by 40 million of private equity funding. Now, this is not because we misunderstood the matching mechanism. This is <laughs> because we're matching now two to one, not one to two. No, this is because translational science is expensive, and it's a very serious business, and it requires Adematics, a serious budget, to take us to the finish line. And our investors are ready to take this to the finish line. Um, we've signed, as you know, a very broad collaboration with MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is a fantastic institution. They're showing an extremely high commitment. I'm very grateful for that. And very recently, in January, we published um, a collaboration with Amgen, who've licensed a certain number of our targets and have paid us an upfront of 30 million just to access those targets and now are paying us for other R&D milestones. All those milestones, if those programs were successful, could access 1 billion, theoretically. So this shows you also that pharmaceutical, established pharmaceutical players are seeing the value of targets that you already saw when you uh, kindly granted the secret uh, grant. And very lastly, which is also progress, I want to show you our commitment actually to building a sustainable company in Texas. I understand in our new company product development grant, that is an important goal, and we are committed to Texas. As you know, we've moved into a, a, a significant footprint facility in Houston, Texas. We've hired 41 people so far. Our plan is to hire about 50 people by the end of this year, so this is according to plan. It could be more. Um, and actually, two senior management members have moved from Germany uh, to Houston. Uh, one is Stefan Walter, our chief scientific officer, um, who was here already 2014 and moved with his family in mid-2015. Um, Stefan's a passionate barbecue specialist, and he's learning to smoke. <laughs> and I can tell you his, his beef brisket, although he's German, is, is phenomenal. Um, and I'm also trying a little to learn Texan and really enjoying it. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are very serious about this. We've brought this technology here to Texas. We're committed to Texas. Uh, we want to build a sustainable company here, and we, th we think they're all ingredients actually in place to do so. And so we're here also with an obligation to deliver this to cancer patients in Texas and beyond. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Singh. I'll begin by recognizing Mr. Montgomery. He'd like to repeat into the record your accolades to the Oversight <laughs> Committee <laughs> that were brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank All right, you. you got questions, Dr. Rice. I just had one question, just uh, out of interest. You were talking about the ACT log mechanism, and you said that maybe for one cancer, you would have three or four now different targets, and that patients. I wonder, do, pa do, you, do you anticipate patients would sort of get um, one of the of the um, one of the therapies for any different for, for that type of cancer, or do you think some patients might get two or three of those? Um, targeted at the same time. How does that work? So, so that's exactly the beauty of, of a truly personalized multi-product approach, and that's novel. So typically what we do nowadays, a, pa a, a cancer patient comes in, we test whether a certain target, let's say an NYESO, which is well known, is presented there, present in the cancer, and then patients receive a product that recognizes this particular target. And those patients that don't carry the target they go to other clinical trials. In our case, we have a warehouse of eight targets, and this will grow over time. We have a warehouse of eight targets, and all eight targets are tested on the tumor tissue before therapy starts. And then we apply, in a highly tailored fashion, we apply up to four different T-cell products that are directed to up to four different targets at the same time. So the patient truly, as you just asked, receives several products uh, simultaneously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very exciting work. Thank you for being here and sharing it. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Rosenfeld. Thank you. Very nice presentation. I was just wondering, with presenting multiple antigens, are you worried about multiple off-target effects and increased toxicity? Yes, this is a very good point. We are working very hard on describing any type of so-called on-target and off-target toxicities. And actually, our platform, Expresident, that describes the immunopeptidome is wonderfully equipped to actually not only discover targets, but also to validate whether these, these targets are clean. 
So for instance, to give you an example, once we've identified, I'm sorry, this is getting a little technical, but we got the question, so I want to answer it. Um, once we have a T cell receptor that recognizes a target, we have to make sure that the T cell receptor doesn't recognize other targets. That's called off-target toxicity. And now what we can do is actually we can take our enormous peptide library that we have, and no one else says, and screen whether any of those normal tissue peptides are also recognized. And that's a capability that, that we've developed over the last 10 years, and it minimizes um, actually the risk of off-target toxicities. Um, we're doing multiple targets with Actolog because that is using endogenous T cells that already have their own safe fail mechanisms because they've educated through the thymus. For ECT engine, which is the more powerful um, gene therapy approach, we are limiting that to one target per trial initially, exactly because of what you just said. Any other questions from the panel? Dr. Singh, I understand you have some of your team here with you. Would you like to introduce them to us? Well, we have Patty Haigwood actually here, um, who's our director of operations and, and based in Houston. Um, and we have a number of people currently that are in Houston and very busy working on our R&D, so they're not here. <laughs> Could you just, uh, in summing up, talk about why you chose Texas and, and the relative advantages of, of being in, in Texas as opposed to some of the other uh, great centers of cancer research and economic development around the country or even around the world? Well, when we looked around the world, it was clear that the U.S. are leading in terms of cell therapy because cell therapy has been pioneered in the United States. Um, in the United States, there are a number of well-known institutions that have experience in cell therapy. MD Anderson is among one of them. And MD Anderson, besides having wonderful signs, also has this enormous clinical infrastructure allowing access to cancer patients in the biggest medical center, actually, of the world. Um, that's reason number one. Um, reason number two, clearly the CPRID mechanism. Um, CPRID is a catalyst for us actually to raise more money and to show investors that sort of there is also some local commitment uh, that is coming here, in this case from the state of Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. Our investors like that very much and they're very happy then to match those $20 million uh, that we have been awarded, um, up to $20 million, uh, with $40 million of private funding. And thirdly, I have to say, um, what I feel here in Texas, now even more that I live here, is this can-do attitude that I really like. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Congratulations to you on your great work, and thank you for coming and sharing with us today. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair now recognizes Mr. Roberts, who will give us his chief executive committee report. Pardon me, Chief Executive Officer report. Well, I don't know. Those are two very difficult acts to follow. Isn't that stuff exciting? I mean, it's. Um, I'm sorry that it took us so long to come up with the idea of bringing in grantees, but uh, that's the fun stuff, not the SRA contracts. No offense to SRA, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it is really thrilling and. Uh, uh, I'll have you know that uh, the staff has numerous ideas. Uh, uh, we're not going to run out of exciting presentations from our grantees to present to you folks. So I hope that that's an additional incentive to, to attend uh, these meetings. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, kind of cut to the chase on the, the CEO report because we actually have uh, an, at least one other presentation I'd like to get to pretty quickly. Uh, with respect to uh, the legislature, uh, all of our bills are in play. Um, I am uh, very encouraged by the support that we've gotten in both chambers, um, and I am uh, optimistic uh, that uh, in the two weeks or so that we have left, it's a little bit left, less than two weeks, uh, our legislation is going to get through. Uh, so I'll just say stay tuned for my exciting email updates, but uh, uh, things are, are looking positive for the upcoming session. Um, another item I would like to, to spend a, a little bit more time on is I included a, a memo uh, in the, the booklet on uh, annual funding projections, and I'd, I'd like to hit on that if I could. 
Uh, depending upon legislative action, uh, our sunset date of either 21 or 23 is going to leave uh, between 807 and 842 million dollars for research grant awards. Uh, there will of course be additional funds uh, for prevention. Uh, as of today, uh, we don't know for sure if our sunset request is going to, to be extended. I, I, I hope and I believe that it will, but we just, we just don't know. But regardless if it's 21 or 23, the decision will have a major effect on how much CPRT has available for grant making and on how much CPRT can award in each of its remaining years. Uh, the attachments one and two, the Excel spreadsheets, <clears throat> provide um, the projections under, under those two possibilities. These projections uh, that I've used uh, have several assumptions that are identified on the spreadsheets. I've got to, to warn you that there are many other assumptions or scenarios uh, to model uh, that could have been used and we will want to be uh, exploring these alternatives with each of you uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead. Uh, but using these projections, uh, staff is developing a proposal for allocating funds for your consideration at the August meeting. It is likely that the funding projections that you're seeing here uh, will affect future, future annual program priorities that you adopt annually in November. I believe that these budget projections and priorities are linked and should be discussed together by the Oversight Committee. These funding projections and the priorities should be determined by you, the Oversight Committee, with staff providing technical substantive expertise. These priorities are yours. I am concerned that to date the priorities may have been too staff driven with implementation controlled by the rigid RFA and peer review timeframes. For instance, much of FY 2018 is already locked in due to the time schedule of RFA releases that get discussed in the individual programmatic subcommittees. Visionary or exciting changes in the priorities this year most likely can't be implemented until late 2018 or 2019. In fairness to this schedule, a significant revision of RFAs to address new or ideas or tactics takes time, not only by staff to develop in consultation with review councils and outside entities, but especially for potential grantees, applicants, to figure out how to put together proposals to, ad to ad ad address major changes. However, these budget projections reveal real opportunities here uh, for the Oversight Committee to influence CPRT's impact on cancer. And the schedule uh, that, that we are, are hoping to, to roll out over the summer will allow us time and you to analyze the legislature's sunset decision and to modify and adopt a staff proposal by you through the summer and the fall priorities process. Uh, it's, um, I think we're, you know, we're now entering the, the final years of the organization and uh, I think that uh, this particular program priorities developing uh, opportunity um, is a time to assess or, or do we want to continue uh, operating the way we have and we have done and are doing some amazing things. The recruitment program is a legacy uh, that CPRIT will leave whether we go in 21 or 23. The core facilities are going to have an impact uh, beyond our lifespan. Uh, and of course the individual research awards will have an impact. The company awards, uh, uh, the, due to the timeline to develop them is going to run on into out years after CPRT is gone. So we will have had a profound effect, but we still need to sit back and evaluate what are the other opportunities we have. And uh, you are, uh, you, the Oversight Committee, 
uh, have had some really good ideas that I've discussed with y'all uh, individually. Y'all have discussed it among in groups, and I want to encourage you to take advantage of the months ahead uh, for this process. The um, next um, item I have, and I'll be happy, I'll be happy to try and address any any questions on that. I think that uh, each of you uh, will have questions uh, uh, on those spreadsheets and and what it means, and we will be happy to to work through all of those questions with you um, at your at your leisure. Uh, it is. Um, Important to note on page 3-6 of your book, the uh, schedule you've seen before, uh, grant award funds available, um, that um, we at this sitting have sufficient funds to cover <coughs> the proposed recommendations uh, coming before you from the, the Scientific Review Council and the PIC. Uh, and at the bottom, you will see uh, uh, after this meeting, we will have uh, still about 14.1 uh, for prevention. Uh, August will be a big prevention month. Uh, we will have 53.6 million uh, for uh, academic research. Uh, mind you that, that we still have uh, some deferred applications to consider there. Uh, and we will have about 31.4 million left for product development. We uh, have a, a good estimate that uh, queued up for the August meeting is about $22 million for product development, uh, provided that, that all of the e existing reviews pan out. Uh, that uh, potentially leaves about $9.4 million from the budget uh, that was the soft budget that was established for product development uh, that, that quite likely will be available for academic research. Uh, I think it's you know, important to, to remind everyone that uh, even though um, I, uh, as an old budget person, frequently wring my hands over the budget and I worry about it, uh, to date we really have not uh, uh, encountered a situation where we could not fund all of the uh, reviewed and worthy projects coming before us. We've had to move a couple of them uh, to a future fiscal year. Some of them have had their dollar amounts shaved uh, in order to uh, accommodate a, a perhaps a more refined estimate of the needs. But we are still able uh, to meet um, the hopes and expectations of, of the grantees. The very last item I have, uh, and we can discuss this towards the end of the meeting, uh, but I, I want to make sure I get it in front of everyone while y'all are still here, is uh, the November 2017 meeting uh, the, is scheduled now for November the 15th, uh, the week before Thanksgiving. Um, we have uh, uh, established uh, November the 13th and 14th uh, the Monday and Tuesday before the meeting as the dates for our big biennial conference. And uh, I am going to request that the Oversight Committee uh, shift its meeting date in November uh, to take mercy on the, the staff and the schedule to allow us to, to make sure that we're adequately prepared. November's meeting, of course, will be a big meeting. We'll have a lot of awards for you to consider. We'll have the program priorities and, and other issues. Uh, and uh, I, looking again at the calendar, it's difficult to move it up uh, to earlier November because that begins to compress uh, the subcommittee schedule and, and create havoc with those plans. Uh, and it may, may be best for us to look at sometime the week of November the 27th uh, to accommodate that meeting. Uh, we don't need to decide that here. Um, we could if you'd rather, if you wish, but uh, staff will be happy to, to float out uh, possible dates, but I, I would ask for your, your help in, in, in rescheduling that meeting. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's the end of my report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roberts, and thank you for the excellent work of you and your team working to keep the legislature informed and aware of of the work of CPRT and, and what the 
uh, future of CPRT means to this state and, and, and helping our legislators understand the complexities of the issues that are in front of them. You all have done a great job with that. Well, keep your fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, any question to Dr. Rosenfeld? There we go. And before I ask the question, I'm going to apologize to Becky in advance for this question. But w would it make any sense to have a um, oversight committee meeting during the um, secret big meeting so people, all our awardees could see who we are, what we do, see, see what a meeting looks like and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, I think that that's a great idea and we'd love to do it, but the same uh, logistical staff problems are going, are going to exist. Um, you, I know you attended the conference two years ago. Um, staff is um, really focused on making sure that those trains run on time. Uh, we have uh, limited support staff. Uh, that is, is also having to, to work all of the stuff on, on the conference. Um, and um, again, as, 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 uh, that is very appealing, Dr. Rosenfeld, but I, I just think it's going to be a strain on the staff to accommodate that. All right. And I, I think it's, it's good of an idea as it is. It, if, if we had 64 staff instead of 32, um, Maybe we could do both, but I, I, I think trying to move the, our oversight committee meeting so it doesn't put undue strain on the staff is the right direction to go. We would appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, any other questions or observations from Mr. Roberts? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Appreciate that report. And again, thank you and your team for the, the great work generally, but particularly with the legislature's work this year. I Thank know it's you. taken an extraordinary amount of time to make sure that they have the information that they need so they can make good judgments on issues relating to, to the important work well, of CEPA. I will, I will add to that that uh, it is a complete staff effort. Um, uh, the fact that, that we are even in the position that we are in for the legislature to consider extending us two years uh, to grant us the, the what, uh, hopefully uh, will be uh, full funding for the agency is a tribute to you and to the entire staff. Um, we put them in a position where they could consider those requests. <laughs> well, the votes that secret legislation received in the House and the Senate uh, strong endorsement of the, of the work of, of CEPRT and of your, of yes, your whole team and I think shows how far Secret has, has come over the last five years as far as building trust and confidence of the people of Texas as reflected in the work of the legislature. Let's so, keep it up. So thank you. Uh, because of, we, we do have one uh, additional guest here, I'm going to ask that we jump ahead to item 10 and then we'll get back to the rest of the schedule. Um, I'd like to do item 10 and item 11 at this time. and. I'd like to recognize Mr. Lang to provide the product development research program update, which I know will be brief, and then ask that he introduce Dr. McQuitty, who will make a presentation to us. And Dr. McQuitty, very generous with his time to come from California to join us today. And he's got a plane to catch, and we want to make sure we have an opportunity to hear from him. So, uh, Mr. Lang, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guerin. Um, as was noted, we've um, you know, we, we've set up our, our RFA schedules such that we can accommodate variabilities in the uh, in the number and uh, number of awards that we issue to, to maintain the budgetary control that Wayne discussed earlier. So in general, we do two. Our product development does two RFAs a year. So basically, it means every other oversight committee meeting we will be coming to the uh, to the OC with a request for uh, for approval of awards and this is one of those quote off cycle meetings so my remarks will be very brief um, the second of the uh, fiscal year 17 uh, review cycles is underway we call it 172 we received um, 20 applicants um, and they've gone through screening and uh, peer review 
and two of those were selected from the peer, six were selected for uh, at screening for peer review. Those six companies presented in Dallas, of which two of them uh, were, um, were accepted for, um, uh, for due diligence. That due diligence is underway now, so if uh, one or both, you know, zero, one, two of those companies, uh, if they successfully complete the diligence process, are approved by, uh, by the Product Development Review Committee, and of course the PIC, then we'll be bringing those to the Oversight Committee at the next meeting in August for approval. So that's kind of the, the, the main thing. Uh, I will be introducing Dr. McQuitty. He'll be talking about uh, the Product Development Advisory Committee. We've uh, reconstituted that committee. They've be, been very active. He'll provide a comprehensive report on the, uh, the activities and the meetings we've had and the recommendations that they're making. So that's really uh, the, the summary of today's report. All right, well, I'll ask if you move ahead with item number 11 and introduce Dr. McQuitty. Thank you. Um, as you noted, he's traveled here from California. Our two prior speakers came from Houston, and uh, Dr. McQuitty's uh, flown out here from California, so we all appreciate that. Um, he's, uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan McQuitty. He's the chair of our Product Development Advisory Committee. And I should note, Dr. McQuitty and all the members of the Product Development Advisory Committee provide a very valuable service to CPRIT, and they do it without compensation. So we really should recognize and appreciate them for that. Um, Dr. McQuitty is a venture partner in Lightspeed Ventures. Uh, they're a, a life science uh, venture capital firm. He's also, in addition to that, he's the founder and CEO of Ford 47 Inc., which is one of their investment companies, also in the immuno-oncology area, uh, similar uh, technologies to what Harpreet was uh, talking about earlier. Um, Jonathan's been in uh, venture capital life sciences for 35 years in, in either companies or in the venture capital uh, companies that support the, or venture capital firms that support them. He was formerly a partner with Abingworth Ventures, uh, and prior to that, he was uh, with, uh, he did business development for both Gen Pharma and Genetech, too major uh, biotech companies. He has a, uh, an MBA, uh, excuse me, an MA in chemistry from Oxford, a PhD in chemistry from Sussex University, and an MBA from Stanford University. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jonathan McQuitty. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Um, Dr. McQuitty, thank you for being here today. I'd like to just recognize Mr. Montgomery real quickly to, to give you some welcoming remarks, as I know it's your all's friendship and relationship that's uh, helped bring you to the, into the secret family. Well, in particular, I want to thank Dr. McQuitty for all his time and counsel, uh, which is, I think, extremely valuable to us. And my only admonition before you speak is be brilliant. <laughs> I will try. Or at least tell us we're brilliant, either one. <laughs> Perhaps we can both be brilliant. <clears throat> I should apologize for my voice. I'm, I'm recovering from a head cold. Um, and I would first like to thank the Oversight Committee for um, the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, as the chair of the Product Development Advisory Committee, I would like to update the Oversight Committee on the efforts that the PDAC has had over the last 12 to 18 months, but also to make a couple of recommendations about how future product development efforts at, from CIPRIT should be thought about. <clears throat> so you have a written report in your folder, um, and uh, I will summarize um, three recommendations uh, that have already been adopted, uh, but were suggested by the Product Development Advisory Committee. First of those was that um, the awardees should not be prohibited from requesting a second award. <clears throat> I think the PDAC felt that this was an unnecessary restriction. Um, this isn't going to bypass a rigorous technical review, but simply allow them the opportunity to submit se a second request. Um, obviously, CIPRIT would be the beneficiary here of a previous relationship and understand the work that had been done would have a good estimate of the, uh, the quality of the awardee and the work that they were doing. So uh, it was felt that that was appropriate and that recommendation has been adopted. <coughs> the second one was um, relative to the size of awards um, and the idea that awards up to $20 million should be allowed. <coughs> Obviously, this is gonna restrict the number of awards that CIPRA might make, 
but it was felt that as we look forward to clinical activities by wardies, the costs, and you'll see more of this later, associated with that work was of a nature that um, allowing $20 million, up to $20 million, would be a sensible thing to do, and that recommendation has been adopted. Third recommendation was that for those awardees operating outside of the therapeutic area, that CIPRIT's royalty structure should be modified um, to reflect the business characteristics of those kinds of products. And so uh, in those areas, the royalty rate was changed to 2.5% and the cap to 2.5x. And again, um, uh, that recommendation has been adopted. I think all of those will be to the to separate's advantage. Let me turn, if I may now, to um, some recommendations for the future. Um, I would like to thank Wayne and his staff for some very interesting discussions, but I would emphasize to the committee that what I'm presenting here are my views and the views of other members of the PDAC, and I'll try to explain more. I don't know how much of, you of this you can see, but um, and I'm sure you've seen things like this uh, before, <clears throat> but it's looking at the development of a drug through different stages of development. Uh, initially, obviously, there's basic research, um, and then what might be called applied research. This is where you have a compound, but you're testing it still in an, in an academic environment. Uh, translational activities, I'll come to that in the next slides. And then compound development, uh, where now you're taking it, uh, a compound into clinical trials. And then the last stage, which is really getting um, sufficient statistical evidence to actually seek approval for a compound. And as you can see, the, the costs um, in the early days are, are relatively modest. Uh, you know, a, a million dollars makes a big difference in basic research, but as you move deeper into the clinical trial process, particularly once you start getting into late stage clinical trials, the costs are considerable. There's also obviously a heavy attrition here. Um, if you can imagine a lot of compounds being, being tested in, in basic research, um, the number that actually would get to, to be uh, preclinical compounds and then subsequently go into uh, sort of early stage clinical trial, well, these are what I would call pre-POC, uh, POC defined proof of concept. So these are before you know that you have, you're not trying to confirm something, you're trying to establish that it has, it has, uh, uh, it has an important role. And then even in the later stage process, you might need between eight and nine clinical compounds. Um, being for every eight or nine clinical compounds, maybe one is approved. So there is heavy attrition in this process. That's just part of the territory, I'm afraid. <clears throat> if we look at the, um, you know, what the objectives are in these different processes, and perhaps more importantly, what the funding mechanisms might be, you know, in basic research, what we're trying to under understand is the biology of the disease, interaction with different parts of the human system, the human immune system, for example. Um, and then with applied research, you're, you've got a particular molecule that you're using to test the hypothesis and then to uh, see whether that might be itself an effective therapy. Translational activities. These can be done in an academic environment and, in fact, are often well suited for such. But they're doing work which involves um, confirming that the experiments that you, you saw initially, um, giving some interesting uh, information, confirming that that's correct, repeating those experiments, um, making sufficient quantities of it to do a clinical trial, so this is using GMP manufacturing, <clears throat> and then doing toxicology work, preclinical toxicology work, to, to confirm that the safety of the, of the molecule is sufficient that you can start a clinical trial. And then you get into, you know, uh, clinical trials where you're trying to develop, uh, demonstrate two things. One, the safety, initial safety of the molecule, and then initial efficacy of the molecule. You're looking for signs of biological activity. And then subsequently, as I mentioned, you're doing large-scale uh, clinical trials to confirm statistically that you have something here which is both safe and effective. <clears throat> if we go to the funding in the bottom line, um, there's actually, um, uh, you know, there's actually quite a bit of money available for basic research. I mean, it, it is sort of an endless, 
an endless exercise. One could spend the entire budget of CIPRID on basic research. Um, but there are other funding agencies available. There is some government money available for, for applied research and some philanthropic money available there. Once, however, you get into translational activities, these are activities, as I mentioned earlier, like toxicology or GMP manufacturing. There's very little funding in academic environments for that kind of activity. It's not zero, but it's much, much smaller. And as a consequence, and I was up until recently, I would say there was very little translational activity done in university environments. Um, companies would be formed and they would try to get seed funding um, and get funding from angel investors. <clears throat> the problem associated with that is you then have investors who really don't have the capacity to invest in subsequent, subsequent development of clinical trials, and particularly the regulatory approval trials. You'll see a, a parenthesis around VCs there. So venture capital firms uh, traditionally um, were a good source of funding for these early uh, clinical activities and, and even preclinical activities. Uh, 20 years ago, um, when I started as a venture capitalist, um, it would be very traditional for us to fund uh, early stage activities, preclinical activities, early stage clinical activities. Um, I would say that the sea has receded. Um, over the last 10 years, particularly the last five years, um, the amount of capital available, risk capital available to invest in those things has become more and more limited. Um, the venture capital industry is not one which is particularly transparent for various reasons. So some of these effects are not obvious, but I would say as somebody who's on the front line, they're extremely obvious to me. And I would say to any other uh, life science venture capitalist you, you might um, bump into. Um, it is just a drift towards funding later stage opportunities. Uh, one of the firms that back my most recent uh, oncology company has now decided that they wish only to fund uh, phase three studies. They are no longer interested in funding early stage studies. And their limited partners are completely supportive of that. Um, the economic arguments are, are very strong. It's just the risk associated with early stage investment, the length of time it takes, um, and the amount of money, particularly the amount of money, mean that people are very concerned about investing in early stage clinical trials. Um, the, the consequences of that is that the, you know, the availability of funding for, for, for these kinds of activities is diminished significantly. And there are sectors, actually, within the, the sort of life science industry, for example, medical devices or diagnostics, um, where it has become sort of a desert. There really is no funding available for those kinds of activities. And I would say even in the therapeutic field, um, in early stage, there are regions of the country where it's become very hard to find venture capitalists who would be willing to fund this. Let's imagine you have a compound that you want to take through a phase 2A. Well, how much money would you need? You're talking about something like 20 to $30 million in general terms, okay? Um, and if you're a venture capital firm and the amount of money that they have to invest has reduced significantly over time, there are funds now trying to invest out of a hundred or hundred and fifty million dollar fund, they want to make maybe 15, 20 investments, which means their total investment available for a fund might be five to seven million dollars. The problem is that, you know, 25 to 30 million dollars looks without a lot of syndication, which brings its own set of problems, very hard to come up with. And I think that SIPRA, frankly, plays a unique role here. Um, as we saw in the, one of the presentations this morning, the fact that you can make a, a 10 to 15, 20 million dollar grant um, means that a venture capitalist who's alongside that will ha know they have the capacity to fund this to a proof of concept, which if they get, would allow them to attract subsequent funding. So it's this bit in the middle, which I think is, is very problematic. So this just talks about more of the, the uh, <coughs> issues associated with the different stages. And uh, I think I've, I've covered uh, most of this in terms of the comments on the previous slide. <coughs> so 
These are some specific recommendations um, how CIPRA might enhance its impact going forward. In the basic and applied research, um, there's no question that a lot of academic investigators today have very little experience about how to set up a commercial uh, structure. Um, I would say that the technology transfer offices are very good at um, covering the intellectual property associated with inventions, um, but they have often very little direct experience in how to start a company. Um, and so I think that providing guidance for um, uh, Afghan investigators would be something that would be helpful to do. The next two things I think are important. The first is in terms of translational activities. These are, um, as I said before, things that would not normally get academic funding. So things like funding preclinical toxicology, um, and making um, more of a material uh, using, for example, GMP manufacturing, um, putting together the, the package which might allow, might allow uh, a company to immediately enter with a short period of time um, a clinical trial. Now, that's very important work, and currently, you know, not a lot of funding um, available for it. And then the second stage, as I um, mentioned before, the critical aspect of helping to fund early stage clinical trials, um, phase one and phase two A studies. Um, right now, SIPA only spends 22% of its funding on product development activities in total. And this means that about 60, 65 million dollars a year is available. And when funding a variety of smaller programs, there's probably you know, a couple of large grants that could be made, two to three large grants that could be made out of that. We would recommend, I would recommend, that that be increased to 90 to $100 million, a 50% increase. This would allow you to put um, maybe five different large-scale programs. Um, and I think that if you're going to end up with a number of drugs available to the citizens of Texas at the end of this process, this area is going to be an important one to focus on. It is analogous in some way, I give people the analogy, to buying a hi-fi system. You can have the world's greatest turntable and a great set of speakers, but if you don't have an amplifier, you're not going to hear anything. I should note, perhaps in closing here, that um, as I think you say down here, I, I don't have a dog in this hunt. Okay. Um, I. Uh, I pay my own way here, and I'm here because I do think CIPRT has a unique opportunity to really enhance its impact um, in, for cancer and uh, preventing and treating cancer for the benefit of the citizens of Texas. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. McQuitty. Yeah. Questions or? Dr. McQuitty. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you again. Could you describe what you see as the characteristics of centers of life science, <laughs> the sort of the exciting centers of life science, including academic and commercial experience? In other words, if you look around the country, San Francisco in the Bay Area is one, right, where you are. Boston would be another. San Diego, Seattle, in, and what I'm driving at is, what do we need in Texas to become a center like that? Not to say that we could do it here at CPRIT, but what's, what do we have and what should we add from your perspective? So I'd say that um, over the last 20 years, uh, the sea has receded. It's become more and more difficult. Uh, let's supposing you were an early stage venture, um, life science venture in La San Diego. You know, I'm hard pressed to think of any large life science venture capital investor in, in Southern California, in San Diego. Same with Seattle. It's become increasingly difficult for people to, to get um, adequate funding. And the problem with that is that people will then, I, unless they have a, a, a lot of sophisticated people around them, are likely to raise insufficient amount of money and will not, you know, get across the Atlantic. If you can imagine you're flying from Heathrow to Kennedy, okay, it's not going to be helpful to get 35,000 feet above Reykjavik and then run out of, you know, fuel, okay? And so I would say a lot of 
a lot of ventures in those areas are underfinanced, they're undercapitalized. Um, and I would say, unfortunately, um, you know, even recently in the, in the Bay Area, the lack of, of, of risk capital in early stage, um, for early stage uh, preclinical and clinical activities uh, has, become, has become worrisome. And I had a recent conversation with uh, the new president of Stanford University, and I can tell you it's something he's concerned about. Boston has, for a variety of reasons, uh, got a quite um, a large number of venture capital firms who are willing to invest preclinically and clinically. The, the environment there is still pretty good. But in many parts of the country, it is, it is not good. And I think the ability for CIPRIT to close that gap, to take what looks like a 25 or $30 million insurmountable hurdle and put up 15 to 20 million, and reduce the size of that gap. I think that's critical. I have a couple of questions, but just to follow up on, on that one, um, you know, from what you read, the country is awash in, in venture capital generally um, in, in so many areas. You've Not got, in life science. Okay, well that's, um, but you would expect that the money would, would go where there's opportunity for returns. And what is it about CPRIT as an investor that would cause it to make investments in that area that's caused a much larger venture capital world to, to move away from investing in, in that area? Uh, you know, the venture capital, smart folks, they're going to be able to eat or not based on how well they do, and they've chosen to move away from the early stage clinical trial investing. What would make us any smarter or any better than they? Uh, and why should we do something that, other than just as a matter of public policy, why should we accept more risk? Why should we work in an area that folks that uh, eat what they kill have shunned? So I think there, it's a great question. Uh, so I think there are a couple of things. The first is that the reasons that um, some of these smaller funds don't invest in early stage, I think it's not so much because of the technical risk. I simply think it's got to do with the refinancing risk. So it's not that they think that that 25 or $30 million doesn't represent a good investment. It's that they don't have enough money to play in that game, okay? That just isn't, the, the amount of money they have under management doesn't allow them to participate at that point in time, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the first problem. Um, well, that's I, kind of a, if we expand on that a little bit, kind of a chicken and egg issue. If the opportunity were there, you, I mean, why doesn't a, a, a system that, in which there's quite a lot of venture capital looking for good deals, why wouldn't it find its way there? Because there's less venture capital and they, um, like being all smart investors, would like to invest in things which have lower risk and a higher probability of success. Okay, okay. so why would we want to do something that falls in that category? Well, because um, I think your mission allows you to take on that risk. So it's a public policy matter. It's a Yeah. By the way, I don't necessarily think that the returns from that investment are necessarily um, going to be bad. I just think that the issue associated with refinancing is a profound one. They can't get into that game because even if it succeeds, they can't play in subsequent rounds. It's like rolling up to a poker game with insufficient number of chips. It doesn't work very well. You, your chips and their chips combined allows them to play in that game. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I interrupted you. You were on to your point number two when I asked you to clarify number the, one. The point number two was the, was the mission. Okay, so really a public policy matter. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, uh, you are from California, and could you share some of the experiences that the state of California has had with CIRM and, and perhaps lessons that we might learn from what California has, has done in, this, in that area? Yeah. So these are my, my comments, not those of any organization I might be affiliated with, but um, I would say 
The, the problem is twofold. Uh, the first is that, um, uh, understandably, uh, there are... Could you go back and just give us a little refresher on, on CIRM, just to make sure our oh, audience... Yes. Uh, it's the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Um, it was also funded by the state of Cali uh, California in the similar way that CIPRIT was funded by the state of Texas. And it's focused on stem cells in general, um, and as a consequence, because stem cells are often involved in, in cancer, a fair amount of their uh, funding uh, goes into cancer-related activities. And the immuno-oncology company that I was associated uh, was a recipient of money from from some. Thanks. So I'd say that um, part of the challenge for any um, funding agency of CIRM's type or CIPRIT's type is that there is an enormous amount of interesting and, uh, you know, important academic research projects that can be funded, okay? And they chose, you chose, to fund quite a few of those. The issue, I think, for, <coughs> for some and perhaps SIPRA will be in a similar situation, that at some point in time, a report will have to be made to the legislature <coughs> and to the voters who voted for it. And their enthusiasm for that academic research <coughs> may be tempered by their interest in prospective therapies being available in the near term. And I think some has found that um, the, the amount of the balance between supporting academic research, Im important research, and supporting clinical trials and the development of potential cures, that balance is one that they may, uh, are beginning to regret. The sense that perhaps they could have allocated funding a different way. The discovery that um, Although they have a fantastic turntable, maybe the rest of the hi-fi system isn't quite of the, at the same level. And so there have been articles in the press um, about the amount, um, amount of money that CIRM has chosen to put on clinical projects. Um, CIRM also chose, and I think CIPRA probably did not do this, to fund um, various uh, facilities, building of various facilities um, at universities, um, including private universities. And I think the feeling was that although that had some benefit, um, you know, perhaps there are other sources of funding for those activities. Um, and did it take away from the, the possibility of funds being used for, um, you know, clinical trials to develop potential cures? <coughs> Thank you. Anybody else have a, Dr. Rosenfeld? Thank you very much for coming, and it just goes to show that Texas does like some California imports. <laughs> um, just want to run an idea by you, and that is that when CPRID funds a company, I, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a one-to-one -one match, so CPRID puts in a dollar and the company puts in a dollar. Do you think there's any possibility that we could come up with a model that where um, there's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one where CPRID puts in a dollar, the university puts in a dollar, and a venture company puts in a dollar, and therefore the venture company gets a lot more support, CPRID gets a lot more for their bang, and the company gets a bigger pot of money? So the, the concept of universities, um, who after all own the intellectual property, uh, putting some of their own money uh, into these endeavors, um, is, has been raised and is a, is a, a good point. Um, I have talked to offline to various endowment uh, members, and I think their concern is that it's hard for them, it's the point that you raised earlier, it's hard for them oh, to invest in areas where um, for-profit private firms um, and private investors have chosen not to invest, okay? It's, they then start to put um, risks onto the endowment which they didn't feel were appropriate for the endowment to, to have, so. I, I actually asked the question wrong. Okay. I, I meant to say that CPR puts in a dollar, the company puts in a dollar, and a venture, either a venture company or a group of venture companies put in a dollar. 
So how, where would the technology be licensed? From wherever the company got it. Maybe they invented it, maybe they licensed it what from would the university. The, the, the third dollar, where, what would the ownership rights be of, the, of that group? It would be negotiated based on the structure of the deal. So they're, they're acting like venture capitalists, essentially. But, 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 but they're getting, for the dollar they invest, they already have, there's other two other dollars in there to take the investment further. Well, look, I think any creative suggestion to, to deal with the, with the issue is something should be considered. But I do think that there's a, an issue here. Um, one of the things that the staff have told me is that, <clears throat> you know, there's, they're getting less requests for um, product development activities. Um, you know, they just see something where there's not as much demand. And my concern there is that part of that is because there's, ju there's just less activity going on in this area. There's just, and I think that that's an area that CIPRIT um, should, should focus on. How, how can we get more, more clinical activity here? One of the difficulties I imagine for legislature or, or any other group to evaluate the performance of CIPRIT is what kind of metrics we should be using to help evaluate that. And I'd like to propose, if I may, a metric. <clears throat> the number of patients in CIPRIT sponsored or, or CIPRIT backed clinical studies. You, you can't guarantee the outcome of a clinical study but here's something for sure. If you don't have a clinical study, you're never going to have a therapy. So you need some shots on goal. And I would use that metric, the number of patients in clinical studies. That's, that's a good way of judging. That's a, I, I agree, great, great idea. And <coughs> just one question, one to clarify one thing you said. You, you said uh, CPR should increase its funding by 50%. And I didn't know if you meant that that 50 percent meant CPRIT should that 50 percent of the CPRIT funding should go to product development, no. or there should be a 50 percent increase from 20 percent to 30. The latter, so that we going from 65 billion dollars to 90 billion dollars, and that would allow you instead of doing two or three large grants to do maybe five or six large grants. And you know, I realize that that may not happen instantaneously, but I think that should be the objective. It is, of course, going to reduce the amount that's available to support uh, basic research. <clears throat> and then my other suggestion is that within the academic grant, some of the grants be directed towards translational activities. You know, I would say the academic world is not always enthusiastic about that. Um, they love, they are naturally, of course, very curious people, they, and there's an enormous amount to be curious about. So they will want to have basic research grants. But I think consistent with your mission, you need to encourage academic groups to spend the time and money to repeat the experiments that they did to confirm they work, to <clears throat> do the toxicology to show that it could be taken into a clinical trial. Um, and those, those are important activities, translational activities, which would then tee up the possibility for a clinical trial. <coughs> Dr. Rice. Just a quick question. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. McQuitty, for being here. Um, two questions. One, do you have a sense of the balance that CIRM had for, quote, product development versus academic research? I, I don't have the details. Um, I do know there have been articles um, focusing on the small number of clinical trials that's actually resulted from that work. Got it. Second question, and again, thank you for, for your responses. Wondered, um, you know, if you had um, um, not the $90 million that you're suggesting to yes. be in, quote, the product development side, and that's going to include translational, would you think that, you know, how would you think about the balance of that? Would you want to have, you know, I mean, X number of, of grants that might be as large as $20 million plus Y number of grants that might be in the you know, two to three million, which would be the translational size, or one to two. How do you see the balance of those two things if you looked at the whole pot of money? Well, there are two different ways to do that. Uh, since the recipients of this translation work will be primarily uh, academic groups, and the work will be done in academic institutions, 
I see no reason why Cypric shouldn't ring fence some money out of the 78% that it was going to give to academic groups and force that into translational activities. That would be my recommendation. There will be concern raised about that, but I think it's appropriate to, to do that, to have academic recipients do that translational work. They're the best people to repeat the experiments, <clears throat> for example. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let me just do an extension of the question. Yeah. Just in the state of Texas, and again, we're always limited by what comes in, but, you know, if you were to have a crystal ball and said, at the end of a good, a good year, it'd be great if Seaprit had funded X number of translational, you know, companies. Yes. Um, what number would you pick? Can you imagine? So in the translational size of things, uh, you know, I would think that, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten would be a good number to do. I mean, you, I think there needs to be a lot of this, okay? Because if you have a lot of trans translational activity, that will give you a number of, of things that can be taken to the clinic. And if you want to do five or six of those, I think you have to load the hopper a bit to do that. Thanks very much. All right. Any other questions? <coughs> Dr. McQuitty, again, thank you. And not only for being here today, but for your work with us on our product development advisory committee. I know Delighted. a great deal of time into that and sharing your experience, expertise, and your time. <coughs> we indebted to you. Thank you very much. Delighted. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Roberts earlier referred to the good stuff. Um, now I'd like to call on Mr. Burgess to give us a work at the Chief Compliance Officer. Compliance Officer. He'll provide an update on grantee report submission, talk about the good stuff, uh, but done a remarkable job of getting the grantee report submission uh, into good, good shape. Grantee training and compliance program activities. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, sir. Yes, let's talk about the good stuff here. My report is behind tab four. My report covers uh, grantee reporting. Um, some of the other compliance activities are grantee monitoring, our desk reviews and on-site reviews, our audit tracking and attestation tracking, and uh, training and support. And I wanted to highlight a couple of these activities for you today. On 4-4, I provided for you a chart, and this shows the grant recipient report monitoring the delinquent reports. And I've showed you uh, April of 16 through April of 17, that's a 13-month span. And the dotted line at the top is uh, our 5% threshold that we've, um, as you may recall, mentioned in the past of sort of a compliance uh, threshold, a non-compliance threshold, rather. And that's about 28 reports a month. So you can see we are consistently falling below that threshold. The 13-month average of non-compliance is about 1.5%. We continue to work with our grantees. We meet weekly uh, internally, uh, review the report, and, and reach out to grantees of any delinquent reports that we have on our list. We've also conducted about 157 desk reviews so far this fiscal year and uh, 13 on-site reviews. We've got another 10 on-site reviews scheduled through the end of August and about 20 or 30, depending on uh, staff resources, uh, of desk reviews to complete. And then the other issue I wanted to highlight uh, as a big component of our compliance program is training and support for our grantees. We conducted uh, grantee training on March the, the 9th, and we had about 150 grantee staff in attendance at that training uh, webinar. We talk about uh, the required reporting, any administrative rule changes, uh, grant closeout, and uh, overview of the compliance program. We also conducted a new grantee training. So before funds are dispersed or advanced for new grantees, they're required to attend a compliance training and we uh, conducted a training for a, a product development grantee in March, uh, excuse me, that was May, May 3rd. 
And the same day in the afternoon, we conducted a second training for new ASOs, authorized signing officials. And in that uh, training with the, with the new grantee, we walk them through our grants management system. It's a fairly, can be a complex system if you've never been introduced to it before. So we have a hands-on navigation of that system and have received positive feedback about our approach to, uh, to that training. And then lastly, we have another grantee training scheduled for June the 7th. This will be a, another opportunity for grantees to meet the annual requirement of compliance training. And so far, we have about a, another 150 or so registered for that training. And that's the end of the good stuff. Um, <laughs> anything else? Any questions for me? I would like to note if, if this chart on page 4-4 if you were to go back, you started April 16. If you were to go back a few years beyond that, the number of delinquent reports, you'd have to change the scale. You couldn't even fit it on this page. Uh, just to show the remarkable progress that you all have, have made, that we're talking about you know, low double digits and single digits in some months compared to hundreds in, in, in the past. So yes, sir. you all have done an extraordinary job of of uh, cracking the whip and also <laughs> training our grantees in, in, in bringing about compliance. It's, we don't want to have too short of a memory and not appreciate what uh, progress this, this chart represents. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank thanks. You. Absolutely, Burgess and it is a, indeed a team effort at with Seaford, so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Any questions for Mr. Burgess? Thank you. All right. Now turn to item number eight. And I ask Dr. Wilson to please come up to provide the Chief Scientific Officer's report, and he also introduced the Program Integration Committee's grant award recommendations. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Uh, this report will focus on the recommendation um, and to um, uh, frame this, the Scientific Review Council and uh, Program Integration Committee considered recommendations from uh, the result of three recruitment uh, focused awards, the Established Investigator, Rising Star, and First Time Tenure Track. And I think, um, if I may, I was going to present all of the recommendations uh, as a single report um, to you as we have had in the past. First um, recommendation is RR170026, application from uh, Rice University to recruit Benjamin Frigley uh, from the University of Florida. Dr. Frigley is a mechanical engineer trained uh, at Stanford, and I say, as I mentioned, is currently at the University of Florida, where he has um, developed a program that uses uh, large data sets to allow him to describe and then predict best outcomes for extensive pelvic and upper uh, or uh, lower extremity surgeries. Um, Rice is excited about this recruitment because Dr. Frigley's uh, expertise applies directly to the recovery uh, and survivorship quality of individuals undergoing treatment for uh, cancers of the bone, specifically osteogenic sarcoma, which affects a small number but important number of adolescents, about 400 uh, nationally a year. In addition, his expertise then brings into the opportunity at Texas Medical Center to build a center of excellence that would uh, pair with the Texas Children's Hospital orthopedic surgeons and orthopedic surgeons at MD Anderson. Second um, recommendation is our 170040. This is in response to the Rising Star uh, recruitment. Baylor College of Medicine is recruiting Heinrich Jasper uh, from the Buck Institute of Research on Aging. Dr. Jasper is a uh, biologist who studies the uh, impact of aging as a risk factor for development of cancer and brings us expertise uh, to the uh, to Baylor College of Medicine. Part of his focus will be on lung cancer. 
And then there are eight first-time tenure-track faculty uh, recruitment recommendations. Three of these are to Baylor College, two to Rice University, one to the Texas Tech University Health Science Center at El Paso, and two to the University of Texas Southwestern. Um, I'll describe these briefly, and uh, it's hard not to give you large uh, pieces of information about these individuals because they are so uh, exciting and compelling potential impact on the Texas uh, cancer research scene, uh, but I'll restrain myself. Um, <laughs> the first is uh, 170023 uh, Baylor College of Medicine uh, nominating Stephen Mack uh, coming from the Cleveland Clinic. He focuses on a very important childhood uh, brain cancer, ependymomas. The second is uh, uh, J.I. Yoon, uh, a nomination from Baylor College of Medicine, uh, coming from the Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, Dr. Yoon has made some very interesting observations about the role of energy metabolism in colon cancer, and she'll pursue this uh, at Baylor. <coughs> Dr. Isaac Hilton is uh, nominated by Rice University, coming from Duke. He focuses on the CRISPR-Cas genome editing uh, activities. And um, next is Colleen Sakalu, who is uh, nominated by UT Southwestern, coming from the National Institutes of Health. She's made some very exciting discoveries on understanding how cells uh, actually metastasize from their primary sites and sort of survive, if you will, a decathlon of uh, travel from primary cancers to uh, distant sites, a very important area of cancer research. Next is Chao Lu, uh, nominated by UT Southwestern, coming from Rockefeller University, works on epigenetics, that is the post-inherited genetic uh, alterations, and how these affect head and neck cancer will be his focus. Dr. Valentin Velez is a physician scientist uh, nominated by Baylor College of Medicine coming from Johns Hopkins, uh, and she will uh, be coming to Baylor to become part of their cell immunotherapy team with a focus on developing cell immunotherapeutics for breast cancer. Courtney Hodges, uh, nominated by Baylor, is coming from Stanford University. He uses computational approaches to discover cancer mutations important in the cancer development sequence. And then last, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Shrik Khan Gadad, who is a breast cancer investigator trained at UT Southwestern under the leadership of uh, super grantee Lee Krauss, uh, is uh, nominated by Texas Tech University Health Science Center at El Paso. And with that, I'll take any questions if you have regarding this uh, very exciting group of 10 individuals. I'll add that um, as you uh, appreciate, all 10 represent response to one of our highest, one of your highest priorities, and that's the recruitment of new cancer talent to Texas, but also s six of these individuals address uh, specific areas of expertise that we uh, have identified as underrepresented two in computational biology, two in childhood cancer, and two focusing on lung cancer. Questions for just a, Dr. Rosenfeld? Just a couple of uh, quick questions, and thank you for presenting. What, how many total grantees were reviewed this cycle? Yes, so uh, of these 10 represent uh, out of a group of 20 nominations, so 10 were uh, recommended by the Scientific Review Council. Is that your... Is about 50 percent your usual? So it, it actually, um, the vicissitudes of, uh, of the recruitment process somewhat dictate this. This actually is the recruiting season, and so it's a higher percentage, uh, and it, I think, represents, in fact, the um, very focused attention of identifying the very best for uh, these new investigators. So, so you don't believe the higher percentage this time had anything to do with lowering the standards? 
Oh, actually, to the contrary. Um, I think that, as you'll see in those uh, scores, these were very enthusiastically identified and I think represent the fact that Texas institutions are now able to recruit at the very top of the, uh, the uh, if you will, uh, applicant pool uh, today, and that wasn't true seven years ago. Okay, and just one other quick question on Heinrich Jasper. Yeah. As we talked about briefly, um, uh, I'm aware of his work. I don't know him at all, but his work is mostly in senescence and aging. And I looked on PubMed and really couldn't find any work in cancer. I, uh, so I, I was just a little surprised he's being recruited for cancer research when his background was in aging and senescence. Yes, so um, as you point out, his uh, his major focus is on the aging and process of senescence, but as you appreciate, that process actually is very much uh, uh, involved in the risk that we all have in terms of the development of cancer as a response to our aging uh, organism. And I think that's why um, his recruitment is so interesting coming to an institution that has invested heavily, as you know, in cancer research now to have the juxtaposition of someone who understands these processes from an aging standpoint. He brings elegant um, experience in the models of aging, which he then will now apply in the cancer, in a cancer setting. Thank you. Yeah. If, if I didn't feel I had a conflict of interest, I would endorse the notion of bringing experts on aging to Texas, but I'm going to strike sure that, that from the uh, record. Yeah. That, uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, Dr. Gadad going from Southwestern to, to El Paso, <clears throat> and I could ask it in a facetious manner. Growing up in Fort Worth, we've always questioned whether or not Dallas really is in Texas. <laughs> but it's the first time that I recall anyway that we've made a grant to move somebody around within the state, and maybe we've done it other times, but uh, help us think about that. I mean, I assume we, you know, this is moving a, a researcher to a place where he or she can make a, a greater contribution within the state, but it is a different way of thinking about recruiting grants, uh, re, um, allocating resources within the state as, a, as opposed to attracting researchers to the state. So just well, what's your thinking ab about that as we can, as we start to have more and more uh, human capital in the cancer region, I could see a good public policy reason for investing more money to perhaps uh, help parts of the state build some research capabilities. But this was just an, a different way of thinking about research grants. So uh, maybe talk about Dr. Goddard specifically, but help us think into the future as we, as CEPR tries to meet the needs of some parts of the state that have been underserved or are in fledgling stages of building research capability, how, how should we think about that? Dr. Goddard is um, very much at the top of the game in terms of, of uh, research and applied research in breast cancer and it's um, very exciting that he'll stay in the state of Texas and that there's this opportunity for him uh, in El Paso. Uh, so I think that's a big win for the state but also for El Paso which has a small but actually quite uh, vigorous cancer biology program that he will benefit from because they have the appropriate mentorship and infrastructure. Regarding the, our thoughts about the first-time tenure track uh, mechanism, I think we all agree that that's a mechanism for investing in new talent, promising new talent, and where better to find some of those individuals than within our uh, individual uh, programs uh, within the state of Texas. So I think that's one of your points. Mm -hmm. And to that point, um, I think it was the wisdom of Margaret uh, Kripke who uh, amended the first time tenure track of RFA to allow individuals who are doing their postdoctoral training are not established investigators as, as yet, but at that uh, training point to have the opportunity to stay in Texas uh, through this mechanism. And there have been three or four, I can't tell you the exact number, but just this year alone we've had uh, a a another example of a similar opportunity. 
looking, and Dr. Wilson, you have traveled around the state and, and met with institutions uh, well beyond just the usual suspects in Houston and Dallas. And as you, you, you think about opportunities to develop uh, the kind of cancer research capabilities outside of Houston and, and Dallas, um, and we obviously don't want to compromise the, the quality of, of what we do. How, how do we think about that, that going forward and where are the opportunities uh, as we try to connect with a greater, uh, more parts of the state than we had been able to um, in the years previous? So I, I, I think this is an important question, one which both uh, separate uh, program leadership as well as our Scientific Review Council consider um, and discuss frequently. Um, what's happened over the last several years, as I see it, is that there has been an investment at many of the institutions that actually are outside of Houston and Dallas, Austin, uh, El Paso, recently Tyler, um, College Station, et cetera. And these institutions are investing in the infrastructure and mentorship required for successful cancer research programs. And so it is those investments that then CEPR can in, in kind um, contribute to, but contribute to without a change in the high standards that have been established for the recruitment of very best uh, applicants when we're talking about the recruitment program or the very best um, applications when we're talking about the core facility or, um, or individual investigator research awards. So there has been no change in our, in CEPRIT Scientific Review Council review to really uh, identifying the very best science or the very best uh, recruits. But what's happened is that institutions like Tyler, Arlington, uh, El Paso have begun to figure out how to build the infrastructure to attract those individuals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rosenfeld? Just a quick, quick follow-up question that I had on Dr. Gadad also. Um, help me understand, is there anything we should uh, uh, know about the fact that UT Southwestern didn't submit the uh, uh, App application for the tenure track facility, uh, faculty member forum? Well, I can't um, address that uh, specifically related to Dr. Gadad, but what I will say is that um, it's usual practice not to recruit your own postdocs. Laboratories uh, actually work very hard to mentor and suggest that, you're, that their postdocs go to other institutions. So it's, um, it's very uncommon practice at Southwestern to recruit your own graduates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, I'd like to call on Mr. Burgess, our Chief Compliance Officer. He'll provide the compliance certification report for all of the proposed awards at this time. Hello again. You'll find my uh, compliance certification report on page 27 of the proposed grant award booklet, memo dated uh, May 4th. Central to the compliance certification process uh, is the compliance pedigree, and that document uh, identifies each step in the award and certification process, beginning with approval of the RFA by the uh, chief officer, through oversight committee approval. In addition to the compliance pedigree for each application, I have reviewed the supporting documentation uh, from each peer review and review council meeting, including the third party observer reports. We contract with an independent third party observer uh, to uh, document the each peer review and review council meeting. Uh, we reviewed the conflict of interest documentation, uh, post-review statements from each meeting, as well as sign-out sheets and attendance sheets. And I also attended the 
Program Integration Committee meeting on May 2nd as an observer, and I confirm that the PIC review process complied with separate statute and administrative rules. Having reviewed the supporting documentation and conferred with the CPRIT staff and SRA staff, our third-party grants administrator, I'm satisfied that the application review process that resulted in the three academic research mechanisms recommended by the PIC, the Program Integration Committee, followed applicable laws and agency administrative rules, and I certify these award recommendations for the Oversight Committee's recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. No Oversight Committee member has reported a conflict of interest with any of these recommendations. Does anyone have a conflict of interest to report that at this point? Hearing none, members, you have a, the list of applications and grant amounts recommended by the PIC for the Academic Research Grant Awards. The PIC's recommendation will be approved if two-thirds of the Oversight Committee members present and able to vote approve the PIC's funding recommendations. Rather than taking a vote on each of the 10 grant recommendations individually, I'll ask for a vote to approve all of the recruitment awards. Second. If we got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing approval from at least two thirds of the members present able to vote, the motion carries. I will now entertain a motion delegating contract negotiating authority to the CEO and CPRT staff to authorize the CEO to sign the contracts on behalf of CPRT. So moved. Got a motion? Second. And a second. All in favor, vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, uh, now I'd like to call on Dr. Garcia to give the Chief Prevention and Communications Officer report. There. My report is standing between lunch and um, so I will well, be. Not necessarily. <laughs> uh, we're, we have a member that's going to have to leave so we may uh, push right on through. Okay. Go ahead. Um, but this will be very brief. Um, we, like product development, do not have awards this cycle. We have uh, awards two times a year, so just have some brief updates. Uh, under tab six is my prevention program update. Uh, really an update on the next two cycles before us. Um, <clears throat> the last cycle of the fiscal year, uh, cycle two of 2017, uh, we'll be having our panels meet in Dallas, May 31st through June 2nd. So if you are interested, I can send you the detailed timed agendas for those. Uh, would love to have any of the oversight committee members attend who can. Um, so there you see we're uh, evaluating 37 applications that are recommending 52 million, re requesting 52 million dollars. We have about 14 million available for the rest of the year. Uh, the next cycle for the first cycle of 2018 is well underway. We're planning to release four RFAs June 8th. Uh, the reviewers have been polled and we have dates now for the December peer review and I will be sending those out shortly. Uh, for the second cycle of the fiscal year of 2018, we began last week a discussion with the prevention subcommittee about some uh, strategies to really look at how we might do, uh, provide better coverage in our rural areas. So um, I think you know that currently our grantees are doing very well with coverage of the state. We're covering all but two counties in the state. However, we know there are some gaps in the kinds of services being provided. So I hope over the next couple of weeks to continue those conversations and look at how we can provide um, more coverage to some of our rural areas. So more to come on that. Um, with that, that is an update for my prevention program. I can move into an update on our communications activities, which are in the next tab, unless you have questions about the prevention program. The only thing I wanted to add from the subcommittee meeting, Mr. Chair, if I may, please, is um, we talked about needs-based and outcomes, and the fact that in certain instances, 
the need was there, but the competence for the completion of the grant applications was not. And we talked about just for the ref for the for reference for the rest of the oversight committee is the that we want to focus on how we can assist those entities, especially in the rural areas that need these services, these prevention services, but just didn't have the competency level in order to make the grant palatable for approval. So the idea was, uh, or is discussed, as to how we can impact that and improve the outcomes for not only the, uh, the residents of Texas with the prevention programs, but the, uh, the entity itself and being able to uh, achieve that. So kind of coming up with a balance that hadn't been there before and being more, I guess, um, from my vernacular, being more proactive as opposed to reactive to the RFAs and what we can do. So when we see an RFA that we know there's a needy out, there's a need there, but they're not uh, capable at this particular time to, to do the grant appropriately, we'll figure out how to help them achieve that. Is that right? Did I cover that? That, that's correct. We talked about um, areas of need and some of the things we have encouraged in the past and that we've seen work well um, have been these kinds of coalitions or networks. So the very small providers, uh, for example, we know a federally qualified health clinic might be able to deliver services but just does not have the resources to um, either apply or do uh, all of the reporting that's required. So forming networks and coalitions and maybe having one uh, entity act as the administrator, if you will, uh, of that project seems to have worked in other areas. So how can we encourage um, and be a little more, as you said, a little more proactive in identifying uh, those kinds of partnerships or hel helping people find each other in those kinds of partnerships. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mark. Go with, he's the chairman of the, the Prevention Committee, and I want to thank him and commend him for his advocacy on behalf of um, this issue. Many of the communities in Texas have the great needs and, and struggle to uh, come up with the capabilities to, to meet those needs. So you're work in this area is very important for us as an oversight committee. Thank you, Mr. Margo. Proceed. But, okay. okay. Uh, communications update in your uh, same tab, page uh, three. We have um, just an update of some of our activities. You have a few clips of the earned um, media that have come through after grant award announcements or uh, some of the reporters following our legislative activity. Um, but in addition to that, I think we've talked a bit about our media strategy for hooking onto cancer awareness months to get coverage of our grantees in local areas. And this has been very uh, successful. And in just a minute, I want to show you just a little television report clip from one of those to give you some of the fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sh just show you an example of, of what we're trying to do with those cancer awareness months, and we've been very happy with the success of that. Um, we've also stepped up our production of videos, um, again, some of that revolving around cancer awareness months, but also interviewing of our grantees. Um, you'll see today we're taking advantage of two of our grantees being here, and we're set up to do interviews with them that then we can use on social media and on our website. Uh, we also are doing other more in-depth interviews with grantees. We had a very nice one that we've developed um, out of UT Southwestern, a SPORE grant that's a, a specialized program of research excellence uh, on kidney cancer. And the video talks about secret support in helping them get to this award which, a very, which is a very prestigious award. There's only two in the U.S. on kidney cancer, and this is one of them. Um, that one's just about ready. When it's ready, we'll send out the link or maybe show it here at, at another meeting. Um, so we've also stepped up our social media presence, and thanks to uh, 
to Spencer on our staff. We're getting a lot more activity on social media, both with the Cancer Awareness Months and some of our own original content that we're pushing out on social media. Um, of interest uh, this month, May, is uh, National Cancer Research Month, and Chris, our communications specialist, has been working with the city of Houston, and what we're trying to do there is get a proclamation by the city for this month and working with CPRIT's grantee institutions to have everyone at a council meeting and have this proclaimed as um, you know, National Cancer Research Month. We're still trying to make that work with everybody's schedules, and we have a couple of more weeks in May, and we hope to make it happen. We, we shall see. Um, but with that, I will um, ask Jim to play the clip, and then we can ans I can answer any questions about our communications activities. Oh, <laughs> that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Local health officials say women who live along the border have a high risk of getting cervical cancer, but there is one organization helping borderland women and children at no cost. The Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas has three grants active in El Paso right now. With this money, medical professionals at Texas Tech University are helping women get free screenings and HPV vaccinations. They say El Paso sees about 50 cases of cervical cancer every single year and about 15 women die. Professor, one of the professors says early detection is the key to save lives. Make sure that women have access to and get pap smears because pap smears find changes in the cells of the cervix before they even become cancer. The services the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas are offered to women in El Paso and Hudspeth counties. So, just a brief news clip, and we had lots of those in El Paso. It was a very successful trip, and um, we got some great coverage. I think we had about five different news um, clips just around that visit. Any questions? All right, any questions for Dr. Garcia? Thank you very much. Thank you and your team for your great work. Appreciate it. Um, like no, now to go to item number 12, which tab nine. Let's just do this real quick. Okay. Um, Mr. Roberts. Yes, members, uh, behind tab nine uh, is the um, listing of the folks that are being pointed to our review panel uh, and uh, these need to be uh, finalized approved by uh, the full oversight committee the uh, nomination subcommittee did discuss these appointments and and uh, i believe do recommend uh, your approval of these appointments is there a motion to any questions for mr roberts if no questions, I have a motion to approve the Scientific Research and Prevention Program Committee appointments. So moved. I have a motion and second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Hearing no, no no's, the motion carries. I'd like to go to item number 13, tab 10, and also recognize Mr. Roberts to present the nominations and charter to the Product Development Advisory Committee. Yes, this is um, really pretty much the, the same thing. Uh, uh, the nominations committee has recommended these folks. Uh, I, I will uh, uh, emphasize that I, we've used these folks previously, but we see a, an ongoing need. Uh, they have been a very valuable to the agency in addressing uh, specific issues. Um, and it, it really has been sort of a, an ad hoc process up to this point, but since we intend to use them on, a, on an ongoing basis, that we do need to do the, the full uh, adoption of a charter uh, and the formalization of this group. And as I said, I believe that um, these uh, are recommended by the nominations committee, and I would request your approval. Any, any questions to Mr. Roberts? Members, is there a motion to approve the nominations? Got to hear a motion and a second. All in favor, vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Members, is there a motion to approve the charter of the Product Development Advisory Committee? So moved. 
Got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. I uh, ask you to turn to item 14, uh, internal auditor report. The chair recognizes Dan Graves to present the report. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here today. Uh, as Weaver, as your internal auditor, I'm happy to bring to you the results of our internal audit plan for Cougar Bond. Am I, um, okay, that's better. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, as your Weaver, as your internal auditor, um, happy to report to you today the progress we've made on our internal audit plan to date. Uh, we have uh, finalized and are prepared to present to you the two reports uh, over training and internal agency compliance. And so in your handouts, um, the training report is uh, page 11-22. And the, the training report, um, covered training of the oversight committee, employees, and grant recipients over that, administrative rules, codes of conduct, uh, administrative, and uh, grant responsibilities for all your, your um, stakeholders. And we're happy to uh, present that there we identified two findings resulting in an overall strong rating for the report. Um, that is the highest rating uh, in our rating scale. And so I wanted to point that out for you. Um, from the training program audit. Uh, moving on to the internal agency compliance audit, uh, it also received a strong rating, which is our highest rating, and that is page 11-8 uh, of your handouts. Uh, the internal agency compliance covered a scope of um, the participants involved, uh, all stakeholders and participants involved in the grants process and the compliance with administrative rules, state requirements, uh, ethics and the secret policies and procedures. Um, and with that, in that audit, we only identified one finding, uh, which allowed us to arrive at that strong assessment for the overall report. We have uh, also completed field work for the pre-award grant management. Um, the risks that were addressed in that audit and covered in that audit are on page 11-3 of your handouts. Um, the scope of that audit included the RFA review process, conflicts of interest, peer review, and grant application approval. Uh, we have had our exit meeting with management and they have uh, provided us responses and we are working on providing a draft report to finalize uh, through this month. The final audit in our internal audit plan is procurement and P cards. Um, the risks addressed and, and that we will cover in that audit are on page 11-4 of your handouts. Uh, we began field work on Monday, so we are actually in the field conducting that audit now. Um, our team is on site and moving through uh, the audit procedures uh, related to procurement and P cards. Um, and so that's uh, the progress we've made thus far in that audit. Uh, as part of our audit plan, we also have follow-ups conducted over all the uh, internal audits for 2016, and we are working through those um, as we complete the, the audit plan for the remaining internal audits. Um, do want to highlight for you, uh, we do have our overall findings matrix um, and progress to date. That's page 11.6 of your handout. In the middle of that page, we highlight the progress to date for fiscal year 17. And so you'll see uh, that section there in the middle of the page that just gives you an update on where we stand overall related to the internal pro audit progress um, from 2015 through the current period. So with that, I um, wanna open up for any questions on over the two internal audit reports that we've issued. You should have those, like I said, in your handouts. If there are any questions, we're happy to answer those. Thanks, Mr. Graves. I understand that the audit subcommittee met on May 8th to re review the audit reports and recommends approval. Members of the oversight committee, have any questions for Mr. Graves or members of the audit committee? Just to follow up on what you said earlier, Mr. Chairman, congratulations to the compliance effort, uh, which we all know is off, not very glamorous, but awfully important. And I think the results of the audit speak to the good job the compliance department is doing. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. If there are no other questions, is there a motion to approve the audit reports 
over internal agency compliance and the training program. So moved. I have a motion, I have a second. Second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Mr. Grace. Thank, Thank you. Thank you and Ms. Martin. Uh, please turn now to item number 15, and I'd like to recognize Ms. Eckel to discuss the proposed administrative rule changes. And on, she makes her way up here. Wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not. <laughs> Thank you. There's no place I'd rather be than an oversight committee meeting. Except today. maybe at Kyle Field. <laughs> <laughs> you raise a good point. Yes, Kyle Field might trump. Um, so I'll start off with the proposed rules that are proposed for final adoption today. These were initially presented at the February Oversight Committee, where the Oversight Committee uh, approved publication in the Texas Register of those proposed rules. They were published in the March 3rd edition of the Texas Register. They were also available on our website. CPRIT did receive one comment related to our amendment of the definition of relative in Chapter 701, which the purpose of that amendment was just to clean up the definition and have it mirror the requirements found in the government code in Chapter 573. The requester uh, wanted us to include within the definition of relative in-laws, uh, father-in-law, mother-in-law, son and daughter, uh, brother and sister-in-laws, as well as cousins and nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles. Uh, we base our definition on the second degree of consanguinity and affinity, and uncles and aunts, nieces and nephews and cousins are, do not fall within that degree. So we will not be making a change to our rules as they were initially presented at the February meeting. And if approved today, we will file the final orders with the Secretary of State, and they will become effective 20 days after that. And if there are no questions, I'll move on to our proposed rule, which starts the rulemaking process over again, because it never ends and there's always room to amend rules. Um, we only have one for this oversight committee meeting, and it addresses an issue that arises for grant awards that are approved in the final fourth quarter of the state fiscal year, so essentially during the August oversight committee meeting. Awards approved at that meeting are required to have an effective date that is within the same fiscal year that the award is approved. And this creates an issue in terms of it creates an additional financial reporting period, a shortened period for grant awards that are awarded at the August Oversight Committee meeting, um, affectionately referred to as the fifth quarter, which generally is only about a day. But the issue is that because of the way CPRIT's online grant management system works, once it's established in the system, it continues on for the life of the grant, which can cause confusion and deadline confusion for grantees as well as for staff as well. So the purpose of this rule amendment is to allow grantees that receive an award at the August meeting to have the first quarter of the following financial quarter, so September 1, um, is their initial reporting period. So any expenses that a grantee might incur from the effective date of their August award to the September 1st date would be reported on that September 1st um, FSR, financial status report, so eliminating the fifth quarter. And if approved, we'll publish it in the Texas Register and summarize any public comments that we receive and bring it back to the August meeting. And that's all I have. All right, any questions for Ms. Eckel or the Board Governance Subcommittee? There are no questions. Is there a motion to approve the final orders adopting rule changes to the Texas Administrative Code Chapters 701 and 703? I have a motion and a second. All in favor vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Members, is there a motion to approve the publication of the proposed change to Texas Administrative Code Chapters 703 in the Texas Register. So moved. Have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Eckel. Appreciate your report and your good work. At this time, the chair recognizes Ms. McConnell to present the chief operating officer's report. Good afternoon, members. Um, 
I'll start with the Chief Operating Officer report behind tab 13. Um, I'll just highlight, since you've had an opportunity to review this, that um, we did receive uh, a little over $21,000 in revenue sharing payments during the second quarter of um, the fiscal year, um, bringing our total received for the year to 37,000, a little over 37,000, and um, our overall total is still about $3.1 million collected since inception of the agency. Um, also, with regard to the debt issuance um, history, um, we have issued um, $222.9 million in debt this year. Um, that's a combination of uh, commercial paper and the long-term um, financing uh, that TPFA uh, did on our behalf uh, in February. Um, and so to date, um, we have issued almost $1.3 billion in debt um, since Siebert's inception. Um, if there are, uh, I'll move on unless there are questions. Okay. No questions, please move ahead. Um, I'll move on to tab 14 and um, the recommendation to approve several service contract um, for FY 2018. Um, we have three contract renewals um, for services with Icon Clinical Research for $206,000 to provide due diligence services. Um, the renewal with SRA International for almost $9 million um, to provide our grant management support services and then the renewal with Cone Resnick for $163,220 to provide compliance monitoring services. Um, and then we also have contracts with, um, uh, for outside counsel, three contracts, um, two contract extensions with Vincent and Elkins and Baker and Botts, each in the amount of $125,000, and then a new contract with Udell Isidore, um, also for $125,000 for these services. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these contracts, but I think you're fairly familiar with these services. Thank you. Any questions? All right. If there are no questions, members, is there a motion to approve contracts for the following services? Due diligence, grant management support, compliance monitoring, and outside legal counsel. So moved. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion's approved. Uh, thank you. Thank you very um, much. And I'll just highlight that um, I have, uh, I sent an email this uh, morning um, requesting financial interest disclosure for these six contracts, as well as a contract with uh, McConnell and Jones um, for financial uh, audit services, also for FY 2018. So you will, if, I know some members have already responded, but if you haven't, you'll see that in your inbox. And thank you for all of those responses. Um, finally, I'll move on to tab 15 um, and the resolution to authorize um, a request for financing um, for our FY18 um, debt in the aggregate amount of $300 million. Um, I will note that the uh, expenditure schedule that's um, attached um, reflects about $250.4 million, and that's the combination of what we will actually issue in FY18 um, based on our operations of about $16.7 million, um, $2.9 million uh, with regard to the transfer to state health services, and then um, $230.7 million um, of of uh, grant expenditure reimbursements and advances, and that's actually the combination of um, some FY18 grants, but the majority will be for grant reimbursements and advances for um, grants awarded in FY17 or prior years, um, since we're always um, uh, issuing on an as-needed basis. All right. Any. Any, any questions for Ms. McConnell? Members, is there a motion to approve the FY 2018 bond issuance resolution? So moved. A motion and a second. second. All in favor, vote aye. aye. Any opposed, hearing none, the, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. McConnell. Now turn to item 19. Uh, we 
have election of board officers coming up. The oversight committee bylaws call for the election of a chairperson and vice chair at the last regular meeting of the odd number fiscal year. This means that we'll elect new officers at our next meeting in August. Officers are elected by a simple majority vote. During the last elections, the Oversight Committee tasked the Nominations Committee, chaired by Ned Holmes, to facilitate the elections process. The Nomination Subcommittee will accept nominations and recommend, and recommend candidates for OC consideration in August. Uh, this item is on the agenda today just to inform members, refresh our recollection of the process, and remind us that elections will occur at the August meeting. Everyone will receive an email soliciting their interest in committee assignments. Um, some may choose to stay on the same committee, some may choose to, to move around and ask that you reply to that email and make your your interest known to Chairman Holmes, and he will come to us in August uh, with recommendations from his, his subcommittee. Any questions regarding the election process? Okay. Uh, item 2021 and 22, it's my understand there's nothing, understanding nothing to discuss on any of those three items. The next regular oversight committee meeting is scheduled for August 16th at, at 10 o'clock. If there's no further business to come before the, the committee and there's no objection, the chair moves to adjourn this meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. The meeting stands adjourned at 1250. And I'd like to tell the oversight committee members that there are lunches waiting for us uh, in the in the boardroom. Thank you. And want to also express our appreciation to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board for making this facility available to us. It uh, works very well for our purposes, and we thank them not only for allowing us to use the facility, but their staff is, is so accommodating and helpful in, in uh, supporting our meetings. So thank you very much to them. Staff, thank you for your great work the good stuff and the rest of it too. <laughs>